Snow covers the landscape. The air is quiet except for the sniffles of freezing men. All of a sudden, flares shoot up and trumpets start sounding. Men are rushed forward. The defenders awake from their frozen slumber to the sound of machine gun fire, with curses and screams filling the silence in between each shot. The horde of Chinese soldiers gets closer. No matter how many are gunned down, the wave of bodies keeps moving forward. Out of ammunition, the soldiers start readying their knives, brass knuckles, and grenades for a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Before they know it, Chinese troops start jumping into foxholes, and the organized defense becomes an every-man-for-himself melee. This isn't a scene taken from the Korean War, it's actually what Indian troops experienced a decade after it. And China and India could very well go to war again, but who would win? Despite India becoming one of the main proponents of UN peacekeeping missions and China not fighting in a war since 1979, these two nations fighting one another is a real possibility. The two superpowers have a long-standing border dispute that started in the 1950s. After India gained its independence from Great Britain, the country fought a series of full-scale wars with its new neighbor, Pakistan. But India was not done fighting border wars with its newfound neighbors. During the 1950s, the Chinese government attempted to broker one-sided deals with India regarding its claims to Indian territory. Having demonstrated their willingness to defend their sovereignty against Pakistan, the Indian government refused offers from Mao Zedong to establish a Line of Actual Control, or LAC. The LAC was the name given to the border between the two countries, with the proposed LAC in 1962 extending past current Chinese positions. This infuriated Indian leaders, who then rejected the proposals. As a result, Chinese forces overran and several isolated Indian positions within the frontier area and northeast India in what became the 1962 Sino-Indian War. The fighting only stopped when China advanced to the line of actual control, with some units moving past it. After the two nations brokered a ceasefire, the Chinese said they would move their actual border 20 kilometers behind the LAC, and India agreed to this. But in the 60 years since the conflict, Chinese forces have moved past the decided border into the LAC, hence why the area is still heavily militarized and hotly disputed. Before we dive into who would win a war between India and China, we must first look at the possible options for what a war would look like. For the purposes of this video, we'll analyze two scenarios, the most likely course of action and the most dangerous course of action. For a conflict between these two, the most likely course of action would take place along their disputed land that borders from the northeast frontier down to the Siliguri Corridor, also known as the Chicken's Neck. These borders have been a political and military hot potato for over 60 years now, resulting in one major war, several large flare-ups, and thousands of territorial violations over the years. This highly contentious border would probably be the area for war to break out between the two countries. For the most dangerous scenario, this would mean full-on, peer-to-peer conflict between the two countries. This would most likely result if India bested China in their border war and China needed to save face. Conversely, there is a large majority of war hawks within the Indian population that would want to see a full-scale escalation with China if they ever attempted a repeat of the 1962 Sino-Indian War. Either way, a full-scale war between India and China is not outside the realm of possibility. Going back to the most likely course of action, China and India have been violating each other's borders since the conclusion of the 1962 war. But despite the numerous violations, these border clashes rarely make international news. This is because historically, only about 1-2% to of border incidents here get reported. The world is largely unaware of these skirmishes for a few reasons. First is the remote nature of the area. Situated in the Himalayan mountains and a part of the Tibetan plateau, the northeast frontier and northeastern India are very isolated, harsh places places to live, much less fight a military campaign. Secondly is because both nations want to minimize the impact of each other's territorial violations to maintain political stability. Though there are a large number of Chinese and Indian forces in the region, the area currently has some peculiar rules in place to dissuade full-out conflict from breaking out. For example, both sides have agreed that military patrols should not carry firearms. Surprisingly, this has been largely adhered to and is evidenced by the worst case of border violence since the 1962 war. On June 15, 2020, several hundred Chinese and Indian soldiers fought a six-hour medieval-style battle in the Galwan Valley. During the battle, both sides used knives, bayonets, clubs with barbed wire, and bats to pummel each other. Over the course of six hours, 20 Indian and an estimated 45 Chinese soldiers were killed, with 76 wounded on the Indian side alone. It's exactly this type of escalation that would most likely kick off another war between the two powers. <laughs> So in the event that another such skirmish like this started another border war, let's take a look at what each side would bring to the table. 
Starting with their armies, India and China have the first and second largest armies in the world in terms of personnel. In the blue corner, India boasts a force of just under 1.25 million active duty personnel. In the red corner, China comes in with around 300,000 less troops in their counterpart, the People's Liberation Army Ground Force. But the difference in numbers is deceiving. Over the past decade, China has started to shy away from its brute strength in numbers to focus on more precision weapons. On the other hand, India has opted to recruit heavily to bolster its army and make up for some critical gaps in technology. These critical technology gaps become more apparent when looking at the Indian Army's heavy equipment. Due to India towing the line between Washington and Moscow during the Cold War, their military, and especially their army, is equipped with a mix of Soviet, Russian, and Western equipment, and none of it is the best either side has had to offer. As for the army, the vast majority of their equipment is Russian or Soviet origin. Take their main battle tanks, for example. The primary main battle tank of the Indian Army is evenly split between the Russian T-90 and the Soviet T-72, fielding about 2,000 and 2,400 tanks respectively. These vehicles make up the bulk of India's armored force. As for the T-72, though being a battle-hardened platform seeing action across the globe, the US invasion of Iraq and the current war in Ukraine have shown that these legacy Soviet systems have little place on a modern battlefield. With known vulnerabilities to anti-tank systems like the British Inlaw or American Javelin, these Soviet tanks are vulnerable to modern top-down attack weapons. Due to the Chinese military's infamous campaign of stealing information and reverse engineering critical technology, they've developed their own domestic copy of the American Javelin. Known as the HJ-12, if you put them side by side, you'd be hard-pressed to find many differences between the two. Purported to have a range just under the American Javelin at 2 kilometers, the Chinese HJ-12 has been in active service for several years. On the other hand, the Indian military is still in the process of creating a similar type of weapon system. Though they have carried out several successful tests over the past two years, it's unknown when this system will finally be rolled out and into active service. Until then, Indian forces will not have the capability to launch manned portable top-down attacks on armored vehicles like Chinese troops could. Instead, they'd have to rely on helicopters or improvised missile carriers like the NAG missile carrier that fires the NAG anti-tank missile. Though potent, this weapon system has also proven to have issues firing in environments with heavy smoke, fog, or dust. This is a big problem for India, who heavily relies on the Russian-built T-90s as the backbone of their armored force. The T-90 was Russia's solution to eventually replace the failed T-80 and the aging T-72 and T-64 series of tanks. Envisioned to have state-of-the-art sensors, fire control computers, and armor, the tank was supposed to be the best tank in Russian service, and arguably it is, even if Russia's plans for sophisticated electronics never really panned out the way it hoped. The cornerstone of the T-90 is its Arena Active Protection System. The only problem is, Russia did not include that system in its foreign sale agreements. Active self-protection systems are considered the gold standard for modern tanks. This is because tank armor can only get so thick and heavy before it starts to encumber the vehicle's movement. Active self-protection is a concept taken from naval warfare and put onto a tank. Here a series of radars scan for incoming missiles or projectiles. The tank can detect these threats and can either fire off flares or chaff for a soft kill or fire its own interceptors at it for a hard kill. Some tanks can even perform soft kills by jamming the radio waves that the missile's onboard radar is using. With that in mind, the Indian military doesn't have access to this critical technology because, as is common with export weapons, the host country selling it does not want to give away all the technology that goes along with it. Because Russia has kept the arguably pretty good Arena Active Protection System a state secret, India has been trying to outsource its procurement of more advanced protection systems to other countries to no avail so far. Despite not being able to find a good supplier for active protection systems, India has produced its own completely indigenous tank, the Arjun. The Arjun is the first and only tank entirely designed and produced in India. While India did produce most of its T-72s and T-90s under a Russian license, Indian engineers relied on no outside help and after almost 30 years developed a heavily armored and modern tank of their own. The Arjun is by far the best tank that India can field. With a weight to power ratio of 24, the tank is adequately powered to be maneuverable on both road and off-road conditions. With its 120mm main gun, it can fire a wide range of rounds and its heaviest armor brings it to a weight of just under 60 tons fully combat loaded, with the newest variant weighing in at 67 tons which is comparable to an American Abrams tank. This tank also has an active protection system, the only tank in India's arsenal to have this feature. Designed around 
on detecting incoming electromagnetic signals from anti-tank guided missiles, the Arjun can then use jamming and smoke shells to defend against these threats. While certainly a leap in Indian armored technology, this capability would still be outclassed by more modern protection systems seen in Western countries or even Russia. Squaring off against India's tanks would be a wide variety of Chinese tanks. Outnumbering Indian tanks by about a thousand, the Chinese advantage in numbers doesn't give it much of an edge over India due to Chinese tanks having weaker engines, a lack of adequate protection systems, and no combat experience. The two mainstays of the Chinese armored force are the Type 96 and Type 99, numbering 2500 and 1200 respectively. These tanks make up the bulk of the armored force that would stream across the Indian frontier in the event of another Chinese invasion. As for the Type 96, the tank was born from a knee-jerk reaction by the Chinese military leadership. The Type 88 tank was largely based on legacy Soviet models, like the T-54-55 tanks. These tanks made up the bulk of Saddam's tank force during the Gulf War, and Chinese officials watched in horror as modern Western main battle tanks completely annihilated them. Because of this, the Type 96 was rushed through its development process. This resulted in the creation of an adequate enough tank that wasn't much better than its predecessor, the Type 88. Although it was slightly heavier and had better armor, it was severely underpowered. With just a measly 730 horsepower, later upgraded to 865, only the latest models have an engine that is not underpowered. With a power-to-weight ratio of about 18 for older models, the early Type 96 was much less maneuverable than its heavier Western counterparts. Additionally, the Chinese also implemented a similar active protection system to the one used on the Arjun, but stopped equipping their tanks with it when modern anti-tank missiles could defeat it. Because of this, a replacement for the Type 96 was needed almost as soon as it entered service. The next step was the Type 99. The Type 99 was a massive improvement over the Type 96. The Chinese army installed a 1500 horsepower twin turbo diesel engine to solve its chronic issues of being underpowered. Now with a power factor of about 27, the tank is on par with Western tanks in terms of maneuverability. The tank also got thicker armor that pushed its weight into the 50-ton range. However, its crown jewel was its active protection system. The Type 99 received an upgraded version of the Type 96's protection system, with improvements in both jamming and radar technology technology, but its most unique feature is the system's laser weapon. China claims that their APS systems use lasers to destroy incoming missiles. This claim, like most other Chinese military claims, have never been verified by independent observers. It's more likely that the Chinese use lasers to disrupt or confuse seekers on inbound missiles versus creating some death ray that explodes missiles on impact. While little is known about these systems, Western analysts have argued that the laser's effectiveness in low visibility situations, such as when operating in heavy smoke, fog, dust, and snow would be greatly limited. Because of this, the tank crew's best weapon would be the all-around radar that could detect incoming threats and alert the crew of a missile seeker. As far as comparing the two countries' tank forces, they're pretty evenly matched. As everyone is aware, the Russian use of T-72s in Ukraine has yet to work out well for them. This is because tanks like the T-72 are not much better than target practice on a modern battlefield without modern upgrades to sites, fire control computers, and active protection systems. It's unknown whether or not India has been upgrading their fleet of existing T-72s, and due to budget constraints, it's unlikely they've been outfitted with the most modern upgrades. Even so, we do know that they have made many upgrades to their T-90s by incorporating advanced gun sites, computers, and communications equipment from countries like Israel and France. These upgrades have made the Indian T-90 arguably better than the ones in Russian inventories. When comparing the two countries, the T-72 and Type 88, as well as the Type 99 and T-90, are evenly matched. India would have a slight edge in its newest Arjun tanks, but there are only two in service, and it would need many more to make a difference on the battlefield. Additionally, because the Chinese soldiers have better anti-tank weapons and the HJ-12, Indian armor would be in more danger than Chinese tanks. And as far as comparing air forces, the scale tip much more in favor of China. The core of India's Air Force comes in the form of its 173 MiG-21s and MiG-29 aircraft. Comprising the heart of its multi-role aircraft are the 272 Russian Su-30 Mark I aircraft. Opposing these Indian planes are just over 2,000 Chinese fighters and multi-role aircraft. The mainstay of the Chinese air arm would be the J-10 and J-11 aircraft, each with around 500 in surface. The MiG-21 and MiG-29s that India fields are quite old. Having been built in the 1960s and 70s, these planes are better suited for museums and modern airspaces. This is evidenced by a notable amount of crashes the Indian Air Force 
Force has suffered over the past several years, including one last year where two pilots died. The causes of the accidents have been kept a state secret, but it's likely because India's airframes are old and spare parts are hard to come by. In fact, by 2025, India will ground all its remaining MiG-21 aircraft, just over 100, and the MiG-29s will likely have to follow soon. This means that these airframes are likely in such bad shape they cannot continue flying routine training missions, much less continuous combat sorties. With 200 or so MiG fighters out of the question, India will have to rely heavily on its Su-30 aircraft in case of a war. While India has several newer aircraft models like the Dassault Mirage and Rafale, these number less than 100 total units. More than likely, the Indian Air Force would send its Su-30 aircraft to retake the skies over the northern frontier if tensions escalated to full-out war. Comparing the Su-30 to the J-10 and J-11 aircraft, we see the Su-30 is much heavier, about twice as heavy, but it's able to achieve slightly better speeds. The J-10 and J-11 were both leaps in Chinese aviation technology. While the J-11 is a domestically produced Su-27 built under license, the J-10 was domestically designed and produced. Both these aircraft can achieve faster speeds, higher service ceilings, and more maneuverability than any other Chinese aircraft produced before. However, in a dogfight, they would be at a slight disadvantage depending on where they were. Under normal conditions below 20,000 feet, the Su-30 would easily outgun them, since their radars and missiles can hit them further than their own organic sensors could track the Su-30. However, in altitudes above 20,000 feet, the Su-30 loses some of its maneuverability due to how heavy it is. In the case of the northern frontier, where altitudes are routinely 16,000 to 23,000 feet, all aircraft there would be flying near the ceiling of their operational endurance. Additionally, this does not take into the account numerous other aircraft the Chinese have in their inventories, such as the J-16 and X-H-7. The J-16 is one of the most modern aircraft the Chinese possess, with about 200 in service. The Chinese have a fourth-generation fighter that is stealthier, faster, and with more advanced avionics than the J-16. The aircraft is also equipped with electronic warfare packages that can suppress or destroy enemy air defenses, something that India only added to its inventory for the first time in 2020. Because of all this, the Indian Air Force would be at a severe disadvantage in any scenario against the Chinese Air Force. The Indian Air Force is both outgunned and outnumbered in almost every area, with them losing several hundred aging MiG fighters over the next several years. India would be hard-pressed to come up with a strategy to employ its fighter aircraft smartly. Perhaps in a scenario against China, India could take a page out of the Ukrainian playbook and move their aircraft around. They could have mobile air bases and store them in forested areas to prevent being seen taking off from highways. Because of the huge difference in the capability and numbers, the best the Indian Air Force could do is keep the skies contested. India simply does not have the means to gain strategic air superiority over the Chinese. While they could gain local air superiority in remote places like the northern frontier along the LAC, as an overall strategy, India would be focused on harassing and denying Chinese aircraft freedom of movement as much as possible. Due to the northern frontier and line of actual control being landlocked, the Navy would not play a part in these operations. With that in mind, let's first evaluate the most likely course of action before diving into the most dangerous course of action. Because of the extreme altitudes, any sort of mechanized warfare is basically out of the question. Sure, some light tanks and vehicles could get through, but their mobility would be limited. Additionally, resupplying in the mountains is notoriously tough. If not enough supplies are pre-positioned, getting enough fuel up there would be a struggle during wartime. As far as air superiority, though, China has many more aircraft. The extreme altitudes would mean all aircraft have to carry less fuel and ordnance than they normally would. The freezing temperatures and poor weather most of the year would undoubtedly affect flight time. Because of this, even if the Chinese gained air superiority, foul weather would likely negate most of the advantage, leaving their infantry formations exposed to Indian fire. Since the high mountains limit armored warfare and foul weather would limit aircraft sorties, the fight in the northern frontier would likely boil down to a light infantry and artillery duel. Because China has about twice the amount of artillery India possesses, it could in theory outgun Indian artillery. But again, the mountains come into play. Fighting in these extreme conditions would limit most types of radar. Modern artillery systems use radar to detect incoming rounds. This information is then used to direct fire missions to the location of enemy batteries. Because of the high elevations of these mountains, artillery crews would be very limited on when and where they could fire. 
Thus, an artillery fight in these conditions would probably involve a lot of direct line-of-sight shooting. That kind of fighting would come down to the individual crew's ability to load, sight, and fire their guns faster and better than the other side can. This would definitely level the playing field. Another factor that would level the playing field would be the Indian Army's actual combat experience. China has not fought in a conflict since its disastrous 1979 invasion of Vietnam. On the other hand, the Indian military is quite battle-hardened. From border skirmishes with Pakistani soldiers and Islamic militants in the northwest frontier to fighting several different guerrilla groups in northeastern India, the military has been engaged in fighting low-level insurgencies combined with flare-ups with Pakistan from time to time. Additionally, India has historically been one of the largest contributors of peacekeepers to UN missions. At any given year, on average, several thousand Indian soldiers are deployed to combat zones abroad. With that number in mind, there are likely tens of thousands of soldiers who have combat experience abroad still serving in the Indian Army. Combined with the tens if not hundreds of thousands of troops who have experience serving in conflict zones internally, India has the upper hand in terms of combat experience. Because the Chinese troops lack this experience and the extreme environment negating many advantages in Chinese technology, Indian forces would likely have the edge as long as their command and control employed their infantry effectively. During the 1962 war, the Indians suffered heavy casualties because their generals did not want to give up any ground. This caused units to become isolated and surrounded as they were not allowed to retreat, and Chinese formations simply overwhelmed and wiped out these outposts. Modern Indian strategists suggest that in the event of another border war with China, Indian troops should have mountainsides and roads rigged with explosives. Doing this would slow down Chinese troop movements and could force them into prepared positions where Indian troops would have the advantage. However, this strategy hinges on the fact that Indian territory would have to be given up to bottleneck Chinese troops into these traps. Voluntarily allowing Indian territory to be surrendered is something that Delhi is not too keen on doing since any land occupied by China during the conflict is unlikely to be given up, as evidenced by the 1962 peace accords. In the case that the border war leads to a larger conflict, the conflict would likely be fought with naval, space, cyber, and missile assets, at least for the first stage. Theoretically speaking, the war aim of China would be to land an invasion force in India to take over a major population center. The Chinese Navy would be the star of the show for the first half of that fight. When comparing the two countries' navies, the Chinese Navy appears to have the advantage at first glance. Over the past 20 years, China has been on an aggressive campaign to modernize and strengthen its navy from a regional power that could only operate in the South China Sea to a navy that could operate in any waters around the planet. Part of this modernization has been the development of surface combatants and submarines. As far as surface combatants, the Chinese outnumbered the Indian Navy with 67 modern surface combatants against roughly 41 modern Indian combatants. The term modern typically means large surface combatants equipped with vertical launch systems, a combat system suite capable of launching modern missiles. When considering these numbers, China has about 26 Luyang's destroyers and 30 Zhangkai frigates. On the other hand, India can field just 24 destroyers and frigates of various types that have the same capability. The Luyang destroyers and Zhenkai frigates represent the best in Chinese naval advancements. These two ships can fire some of the most advanced missiles China has in its arsenal, including the much-feared YJ-62. These ships are, for all intents and purposes, China's attempt to copy the American Aegis combat system and the destroyers and cruisers that house them. Complementing the Chinese ships are their ability to operate with their own tactical data links, like the American Link-16. Tactical data links are huge in naval warfare, since if tracks and information cannot be shared securely between ships, it defeats the purpose of the extended range these combat suites provide. While these two ships represent the best in the Chinese surface fleet, it's what's beneath the waves that should scare India's leadership. The Chinese Navy fields the world's second most capable submarine force behind the US. While the Chinese field a variety of nuclear-powered submarines, their most fearsome is the Type 39A Yuan-class submarines. What makes these so special is the engineering plant inside of them. For decades, what's made nuclear-powered submarines better than traditional diesel-electric boats has been the fact that the nuclear-powered subs never had to surface. Unlike their nuclear counterparts, diesel-electric submarines have to surface to recharge their batteries, making the vessel vulnerable to attack from surface ships and aircraft. 
For decades, countries have been trying to create a reliable engineering plant where diesel submarines would not have to surface. Known as Air Independent Propulsion, or AIP, about 10 countries have figured out how to create this type of engineering plant as of today. However, there's much variation in the effectiveness of these plants, with China claiming that they made the best AIP engineering configuration to date. There's still a huge debate in the naval community on whether diesel or nuclear submarines are harder to detect. Each one has its own pros and cons. However, the fact that China has developed arguably the quietest diesel submarines on the planet is not good news for India. But despite all this, India is not totally defenseless against the Chinese Navy. Standing against the Chinese Navy are several dozen modern frigates and destroyers. The combat capabilities are pretty similar to their Chinese counterparts, with one major exception. Indian naval vessels are armed with the fastest cruise missile in any nation's inventory. The missile is called the BrahMos and was made in conjunction with Russian engineers throughout the early to mid-2000s. The end result has been truly extraordinary. The missile can be outfitted to ships, aircraft, and submarines. It cruises around Mach 1, then transitions to an eye-popping Mach 3 for its terminal phase of flight. The missile also has the sea-skimming capability of staying about 10 feet off the surface of the ocean. India classifies the missile's flight paths, but it's likely it has a wide range of flight paths, including a high diving path, to defeat most modern combat system suites. The missile also has an extreme range of about 500 kilometers, or 270 nautical miles. This is important because this is just beyond the max effective range of the Chinese YJ-62 of 400 kilometers, or 250 nautical miles. But despite this advantage, in overall terms of ballistic and cruise missiles, China is the clear winner. China is bar none, the most prolific producer of cruise and ballistic missiles in the world. With thousands of missiles of dozens of types, the Chinese have made missile technology a mainstay in their arsenal. The primary reason for this has been to keep the American Navy away from the South China Sea by blanketing the area with extended-range munitions since its surface forces could not go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a fight with the US. China could leverage these long-range weapons in a war with India by using them to pummel strategic sites well out of reach of Indian threats. According to maps released by the Office of Naval Intelligence, China can send thousands of missiles against targets across the Indo-Pacific region. In the 1,000km to 5,000km range that encompasses most of India, China could send hundreds of missiles into Indian territory with little fear of counterfire. Another way they could attack Indian targets is through their extensive cyber warfare arm. According to a study released in 2021, China is number two in the world in terms of cyber warfare capability, with India coming in at number 12. But how could this be when India produces the most college graduates in the field of information technology and cyber in the world? The main reason has been priorities. Before about 2015, India was content with just being a regional power. However, their fear of China has made the country's politicians envision India being a peer with China. Part of being a peer is having a strong military, so they do not get bullied by Chinese tactics that they have used on similar nations. Because of this, India began an aggressive Made in India campaign to produce all types of weapon systems domestically. This is why so many of the newest Indian defense technologies have rolled out over the past several years or are still in development. Cyber warfare was one of those areas. India's cyber economy is amongst the strongest in the world. However, for years the private sector has been under attack from a virtual onslaught of ransomware and cyber attacks both from criminal groups and nation-state actors like North Korea. Because of this, Indian society has now hardened its networks to be amongst the strongest in the world. All citizens virtually require two-factor authentication for every website and app imaginable. This same mentality has spread to its military as well. However, India's cyber warfare arm is still in development. Because the superpower has never needed this capability before, they've been working with the US and other Western countries to help them develop their capabilities. China, on the other hand, has the world's largest, albeit low-tech, offensive cyber arm. Estimates vary, but a ballpark range of 100,000 cyber warriors spread among military and criminal groups that the Chinese government directly controls is a generally accepted number. It's a fact that India is the most prolific cyber attacker in the world, however their methods tend to not be very sophisticated. For example, the vast majority of thwarted cyber attacks are actually traced to Chinese government sources. Though China has carried out some exceptionally successful cyber operations in recent years, these can all be attributed to the sheer volume of attacks conducted and getting lucky. 
The best way to describe China's cyber warfare capabilities is through saying, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Countries like the US would exploit one glaring vulnerability without ever being detected, while China would try every way of infiltrating while hoping one works. China would certainly beat India regarding its offensive cyber operations. Still, because India has been hardening its networks, it's unclear how much damage the Chinese military could really inflict. Further compounding China's problems is the fact that it still lacks a significant amphibious capability. Currently, China's amphibious assault fleet is inadequate for an attack on Taiwan, an island just off China's coast, and just to attempt it, China would have to conscript hundreds of civilian vessels. An attack into the Indian Ocean would be suicide for China. While China couldn't realistically threaten India with its naval forces, India meanwhile sits on China's trade jugular. With much of China's oil imports passing through the Indian Ocean, India's navy could, with ease, cut China off from this badly needed supply. This would leave China with only fuel imports from Russia which would barely be enough to run its military. The civilian sector would suffer from dramatic fuel shortages and its economy would tank as a result. But if for some reason China could land an invasion force in India successfully, the fight would still not be finished. China hasn't had the experience of fighting a war on foreign soil in a long time. Keeping their military supplied would be a challenge unless Chinese troops completely overrun the northern frontier areas. So in order for India to win in a peer-to-peer -peer war with China, they would need to hold their northern and eastern frontier against China while also inflicting significant losses on the Chinese Navy. Suppose the Chinese Navy remains relatively intact and Chinese forces conduct a successful two-pronged invasion from the north and from the sea. In that case, India would likely be outgunned and outproduced in the long run, since China remains the world's number one manufacturer and number two economy. India has the bad luck of having two antagonistic neighbors sitting right on its borders. It also has the good luck of having the superior strategic position. This is how India will fight World War III. India's geography makes it, like the United States, in effect a fortress nation. Unlike the United States, though, who is protected by two vast oceans and a polar ice cap, India's fortress has one gap in its armor. To the north, India faces China, a nation that initially got along with it very well. Both India and China spurred the non-aligned movement, which sought to see their nations avoid being forced into either the American or Soviet camp during the Cold War. However, tensions over an unsettled border dispute in the north and China's drifting toward the Soviet Union soon frayed the relationship. When China invaded Tibet and annexed it in 1950, relations hit an all-time low. Since then, China and India have had three major conflicts, with a full-blown war in 1962, which China technically won. Two standoffs between Indian and Chinese troops occurred in 1967 and 1987, threatening to bring the two nations to war once more. However, in the new millennium, the relationship improved dramatically, until the 2010s, when a series of border disputes once more threatened the tenuous peace. These disputes have grown in intensity, with the most serious occurring in 2020, which left 20 Indian soldiers dead and an unknown number of Chinese dead. A US congressional investigation found that China had planned in advance for the clash, including for the possibility of fatalities. The fact that China once more achieved its goals and pushed Indian control even further back in the region is proof that this was no accident. To the west, India faces its longtime rival Pakistan. The two nations have fought multiple wars over the last 70 years, with India typically coming out victorious over its smaller neighbor. However, Pakistan soon turned to directly funding and equipping terrorists to attack India asymmetrically, with many terror attacks in India directly linked to Pakistan's intelligence services. The two nuclear-armed nations remain at tenuous peace today, but Pakistan's realigning toward China has ended India's policy of non-alignment. Realizing it needs friends in this new and much more dangerous world, India has made some very historic moves in drawing closer ties to the United States. Russia has traditionally been India's closest partner from the two powers, but significant failures on Russia's part in developing joint weapon systems such as the Su-57, as well as its significantly reduced position on the world stage, and Russia's own growing ties to China is working to fracture that relationship. Now, India is interested in potentially acquiring more American weapons and realigning itself closer to the US and its Western allies. India's northern border is thoroughly protected by the Himalayan mountains, which form a nearly impenetrable border against any possible Chinese incursion. China, realizing very early on that it sat on the low end of the strategic high ground, invaded Tibet to both prevent it being used as a staging ground for a potential Indian invasion against it and to secure the headwaters of multiple rivers that are vitally important for the Chinese nation. Since then, China has worked to push Indian control further and further back on its side of the Himalayas, 
all in a bid to prevent India from having the opportunity to seize plateaus and establish logistical bases from where it could fly in heavy equipment. While China has built its own, India has not, which means India is wholly incapable of using heavy equipment in any conflict against China. India's robust air defense capability also means that while China may have secured the high ground, a southern invasion of India is suicidally impossible. India has little to fear from a ground war with China. Though China's forward position in the heights does mean it'll certainly lose what little control it has left over the Himalayan region. India's biggest concern is its western border with Pakistan. Pakistan has typically suffered great losses in its clashes with India over the years, and today India is an exponentially more capable military power than Pakistan. A modern conflict between the two nations would inevitably be to India's favor, and with such overwhelming military power, it could threaten the Pakistani national government itself. This is why Pakistan has flat out stated it would be willing to use nuclear weapons to defend itself in a future war, putting India in a very difficult position. To counter this threat, or at least limit its effectiveness, India has developed a deep strike doctrine, wherein Indian forces concentrate power in a small area of the front to achieve a deep, penetrating offensive into Pakistan itself. This would place Indian forces inside Pakistani territory and force it to use nuclear weapons on its own soil if it wishes to use them at all. A bigger threat to India would be a conventional war between itself, China, and inevitably Pakistan, with the basing of Chinese troops in Pakistan itself. With no fear of invasion of its own territory, China is free to use its ground forces well outside of China, and with the Chinese military on the whole superior to India's own, India would face a significant threat if the two powers joined together for a major offensive. This is unlikely, though not impossible, and would inevitably draw in other powers such as the US on India's side. India's biggest problem is its lack of a native arms industry, as well as the hodgepodge nature of its current military hardware. As an unaligned state, India has been very opportunistic and chosen to arm itself with what it considered the weapons that suited its needs best from both the West and the former Soviet Union, now Russia. However, this has left it in the unique position of not having particularly deep defensive ties to either of them. And it's the reason why India today is not a partner with any nation that fields modern fifth-generation fighters. If you're likely to deal with someone's potential rival, nobody's going to invite you to share their best hardware, except Russia which was cash-strapped and turned to India to finance its Su-57. Unfortunately for both sides, India pulled out of joint development when it was clear the Su-57 would never meet its projected goals and would be far outclassed by American and even Chinese fifth-generation fighters. Without a native arms industry, India is naturally reliant on foreign suppliers, which is tricky when those suppliers end up at each other's throats. Today, India is taking steps to attempt to kickstart a native defense industry, but it's waking up to the reality that unless it picks a side, and fast, it's going to be left behind technologically. This is why India has been slowly shaking off its non-aligned status and moving closer to the United States, much to the chagrin of China. Famously, India's attempt to build a domestic tank, the Arjun, was not only decades behind schedule, but ended up forcing the Indian government to buy a small fleet of tanks in 2013. By 2015, almost the entire fleet was inoperable. India does not lack the intellectual capital or manufacturing capabilities, but it does lack the expertise and the highly specialized and often classified knowledge of renowned global arms manufacturers such as Russia, France, Germany, and the United States. Modern weapons are built on a foundation of decades of research and development, trial and experimentation, and direct battlefield observations, all of which India lacks and can't simply be kickstarted overnight. However, India has one significant strategic advantage over both Pakistan and China, specifically over China, and that's its navy. The Indian Navy operates a fleet of mostly modern ships, and it's the second most powerful in Asia. However, the Indian Navy has one significant advantage over China. It is fully capable of over-the-horizon blue water operations, meaning it can operate far from its own shores. This is a capability that China struggles with due to its limited fleet logistics and a lack of aircraft carriers. Today, India fields two aircraft carriers, 11 destroyers, 13 frigates, one ballistic missile submarine for nuclear deterrence, and 16 conventional attack submarines. This allows India to project significant power where it matters most, in the Indian Ocean. Its navy allows India to effectively shut down Pakistan's coastal trade, but it's even more important for one key reason. It allows India to hold a dagger to China's throat. With its navy able to project power deep into the Indian Ocean, India is able to almost completely shut down China's seaborne trade, of which it's heavily reliant on for its oil and gas consumption as well as its economy. 
with two aircraft carriers and multiple choke points in the Malacca Straits and off of Indonesia's waters, the Indian Navy can bring China's imports to an almost complete standstill. China recognizes this, which is why it's been quickly working to develop its own aircraft carriers. Inevitably, the balance of power will shift toward China, with its ability to field a much larger force and more modern weapons, but this is still decades away. Even then, India enjoys one advantage China does not, and that is its growing relationship with the United States. Many Indians favored continued non-alignment, preferring to keep India out of the world's conflicts. However, this is no longer a possibility given China's rapid ascension and expansionist ambitions. As the world's largest democracy, India poses an existential threat to China's Communist Party, who is working to export its model of authoritarianism abroad in a bid for self-survival. China has already helped many regional despotic powers with tracking and surveillance technology, for instance, in a bid to keep tabs on their citizenry. China is also aiming to establish a global monopoly on technology itself. Every year, China poses a greater and greater threat to Taiwan, and while many Indians might consider this a domestic dispute, the truth is far from it. Taiwan is not just a friendly democracy sitting off the CCP's shores, but also the supplier of almost the world's entire demand for microelectronics. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, supplies the world with nearly its entire supply of modern microchips, absolutely integral for any economy. Its 5mm manufacturing process produces the smallest, most advanced microchips in the world, without which modern weapons as well as modern consumer electronics are impossible. If China were to take Taiwan, it would do so along with its manufacturing and intellectual capabilities, leaving China with global hegemony over the microchip supply and holding it hostage to the CCP and its goals. Anyone who disagrees with the CCP might simply face an export ban crippling their economy. This will give China incredible leverage over India that would take decades to overcome. While TSMC is building a modern manufacturing facility in America to help offset this massive strategic vulnerability, it's refusing to allow for construction of its new 3 nanometer microchips anywhere outside of Taiwan. This is an insurance policy to help ensure that the global community remains vested in Taiwan's independence, but once more poses a significant vulnerability should China take Taiwan by force. If India is going to continue to thrive in the 21st century, its days of non-alignment have to end. Otherwise, it could simply find itself waging a losing third world war against a technologically superior opponent or simply forced into submission by its regional rival, China. These are the 10 largest countries in the world by population right now. Number 10. Mexico South of the U.S. border down Mexico Way is one of the biggest countries in the world. The third largest country in the Americas, Mexico has a population of just under 128 million and a high birth rate, 18.3 births per 1,000 population, compared to only 5.8 deaths per 1,000 population. It's a highly urban country. It has 55 major metropolitan areas where over half the population lives. The rural areas of the country are much more sparsely populated and tend to have higher indigenous populations. While Mexico grew rapidly during the 20th century, that has been somewhat reversed and the population seems relatively stable, but it's a young skewing country that's seen as a rising power, and in some ways the future will be defined by one city. Mexico City houses almost a sixth of the country's entire population, making it one of the largest capitals in terms of population percentage in the world. It's the fifth largest city in the world, and it's a busy place that serves as a hub of industry, culture, and retail. If you ask many Americans what the demographics of Mexico were, they might say it's full of Mexicans. But the country is very diverse. It's a melting pot of people descended from Spanish colonists as well as a still strong indigenous population and many immigrants from the Caribbean and Latin and South American countries. And of course, many people are mixed and simply identify as mestizo now a term that describes people of mixed ancestry with a white European and indigenous background. The country is heavily Roman Catholic, with 78% of the population belonging to the faith. But things aren't all sunshine and rainbows south of the border. As the 13th largest country in the world by landmass, Mexico has one advantage many of the countries ahead of it don't. It has enough room for everyone, but many of its cities can be overcrowded and chaotic. It also has a serious problem with crime and cartel violence, as the recent governments have tried to get the criminal activity under control and arrest gang leaders. Despite this, it's a major tourist destination for Americans, thanks to its comparably low cost of living. With a 95% literacy rate, Mexico is a modern nation that's rising in influence, although many governments there have struggled and been voted out because they just can't seem to get a handle on the crime situation. But with the 16th highest GDP in the world, it's likely to keep growing. Now let's head a long way away and way up north. Number 9. Russia 
With a population of 147 million people, Russia is one of the largest countries in the world in terms of population. Even so, its president seems to think that the country needs to become even bigger. The biggest country in the world in terms of landmass by a wide margin, it spans across two continents, but a large percentage of the country is the frozen territory of Siberia, which is very loosely occupied and has played home to the infamous prison camps known as gulags in the past. Its largest city is Moscow, only the 24th largest in the world, with around a tenth of Russia's population, and hiding beneath Russia's massive population is a very disturbing fact. They have one of the worst birth-to-death rates in the world. Their birth rate is under 10 people per 1,000, while their death rate is at 16.7 per 1,000. In other words, Russia is shrinking, and the story of how Russia got so big is a complicated one. Centuries of aggressive expansion led to the former Duchy of Muscovy integrating mass amounts of land, turning the country into Russia we know today. This means countless countries and ethnic groups were simply told they were Russian citizens now and didn't have much say in it. That makes the country one of the most diverse in the world and also one with some of the most unrest. It has large Muslim minorities as well as residents from other countries around Europe. The country has fought several major civil wars, has border conflicts with many of its neighbors, and has shrunk significantly since its height during the Soviet era. Its immigrant population is the third largest in the world, over 11 million. But migrating to Russia may not be looking all that desirable right now. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, many have started to criticize many facets of the former second world power. Between its dictator-like government, its conscription law, and the devastating economic sanctions it finds itself under, things are likely only going to get worse. It currently has the 11th highest GDP, but that might soon drop significantly. Some will find refuge in faith. Russia is heavily Eastern Orthodox Christian, with up to 80% of the population belonging to the faith. Others will find solace in food and vodka, contributing to the country's high risk of cardiovascular disease. And of course, many in the country might find themselves contributing to Russia's death rate when they're sent poorly equipped to Ukraine as Vladimir Putin attempts to put roughly 40 million people under Russia's control, whether they like it or not. Now, let's get much smaller. Number 8. Bangladesh a small country on the eastern border of India, Bangladesh is part of the former British Raj that was eventually partitioned into a Muslim country, similarly to Pakistan on the western side. Initially part of Pakistan, it eventually gained its independence in 1971, and it's the most homogeneous country on the list so far. It's 99% Bengali, with over 90% of the population being Muslim and just under 8% being Hindu. It also has one of the highest birth rates in the world with a whopping 17.71 births per 1,000 people compared to only 5.54 deaths per 1,000. That means Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing countries out there, which may be a problem because Bangladesh is the smallest country on this list. It has a population of just under 170 million, but in terms of landmass, it's only the 92nd largest country in the world being just a bit bigger than tiny Nepal nearby in the Himalayas. That means by necessity it's a heavily urban country, with its largest city Dhaka having over 15% of the total population. Its literacy rate of 74% is considered average for the region, and it has recently seen an increase in refugees and migrants due to crises in nearby countries, such as the targeting of Rohingya Muslims. It's a parliamentary democracy considered to have fair elections, although it has been criticized for its treatment of religious minorities. But can a country of this size really sustain such a large population? Bangladesh's population growth isn't slowing down, and it's quickly running out of space. At the 41st spot in GDP, its economy is growing, but it might not be growing fast enough to keep it from a population crisis. One area where it might be able to find relief is in its education efforts. It's produced a high number of immigrants who have come to the United States, United Kingdom, and other places to work in tech and other fields. Similar to India and Pakistan, one of Bangladesh's biggest exports is its talent, and that might be exactly how it intends to have enough space for its future population. Now let's head across the ocean for something completely different. Number 7. Brazil Welcome to Brazil, the largest country in South America in more ways than one. It's more than double the size of any other country on the continent, with a size that makes it the fifth largest country in the world. It has a population of over 217 million people, which is more than half the continent's population. And its growth doesn't stop there, it has a GDP that puts it a tenth of the world. Not only is this the biggest in South America, but it has more than half the gross GDP of the continent. So in many ways, South America is defined by Brazil, which makes it surprising that the massive country is a bit of an outlier in some ways. For one thing, it speaks Portuguese, when most of the continent speaks Spanish. But that's not the only thing about the massive nation. Brazil is a nation of dichotomies. It's one of the most urban countries in the world, with its largest city, Sao Paulo, having a population of over 21 million, making it the fourth largest city in the world. 
Two other cities, Rio de Janeiro and Belo Horizonte, also make the list of the top 100 largest cities in the world. But outside of its massive cities, Brazil is home to the Amazon rainforest, one of the world's most biodiverse regions and one of the most endangered. Countless species are at risk of extinction due to expansion into the rainforest, and the country has many uncontacted indigenous tribes that the government is trying to protect, or at least they were until the current government stepped up development. The country's long history of colonization and immigration makes it one of South America's most diverse regions, with close to half its population being of mixed race. So what's it like living there now? Brazil is a modern country with a relatively high standard of living, although this varies drastically by where you live. Their birth rate is fairly standard for the developed world, with 13.96 births and 6.81 deaths per 1,000 people. Its 92.6 literacy rate is high and its education system is considered strong. But in its urban centers, poverty and crime are commonplace and the country is struggling to get gang activity under control. But its high tourism rate and rich national resources means its economy is likely to keep growing, and its huge coastline means it's a destination for beachgoers for years to come. Now let's head to Africa's only representative on the list. Number 6. Nigeria We're in tight quarters again, as Nigeria is one of the smallest countries on this list. Not nearly as small as Bangladesh, but in 31st place on the list, it's only just over 356,000 square miles, putting it between the much less populated Tanzania and Venezuela. But Nigeria is exploding in population with a population of over 218 million people and one of the highest birth rates in the world, a massive 34.19 births per 8.7 deaths per 1,000 people. And as the country's population and economy keeps booming, it raises a question. Where are they going to keep all those people? No surprise, Nigeria is a heavily urban nation, with the capital city of Lagos being one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world. It has over 13 million people, making it the second largest city in Africa. But another reason Nigeria's culture is so unique is that it's one of the most diverse nations around. 90% of the population is almost evenly split between Christians and Muslims, with the other 10% belonging to various indigenous religions. This also means it has a great diversity in language with the Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba tribes all having significant representation in the country. And it's become a hub for emigration, with millions moving in from China, India, and the United States. And there's a reason for that. Nigeria's economy is also one of the fastest growing in the world, with the current GDP ranking putting it in 31st place. This makes Nigeria the wealthiest country in Africa, putting it ahead of powerhouses Egypt and South Africa. A large part of this is due to its growing strength in the tech and manufacturing sectors, as its education system is one of the best in Africa, at least in the cities. Its literacy rating is around 62%, but there's a big gap between men and women, and that gap is largely driven by the rural, more traditional areas of the country. But that trend will likely be slowly reversed as Nigeria continues to evolve into a global powerhouse in the tech world, which means your next support call might just go right over to Lagos. Now, let's head back to Asia. Number 5. Pakistan With a population of 242 million, Pakistan is one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, with over 96% of the population subscribing to the faith. The rest are mainly Hindus and Christians, but they're living in a country even smaller than Nigeria. It ranks 33rd on the list, sandwiched between Venezuela and Namibia in size. And it's growing fast, with 27.5 births and 7.2 deaths per 1,000 residents. So that probably means they're one of the most urbanized countries in the world, right? Surprisingly, not quite. While Pakistan does have two of the largest cities in the world, Karachi with over 15 million and Lahore with just under 12 million people, the country is undergoing one of the slowest urbanization processes in the world. That means that many of its citizens live in small communities or in isolated tribal regions where the government has little involvement. That was the case for the mountainous region of Abbottabad, where one unwanted resident, Osama bin Laden, holed up for several years without being detected. But did the government know? No one knows, but the oversight in the more isolated regions of the country is slim at best. And that's left a lot of gaps in the country. In some ways, Pakistan is a powerful country, it's a nuclear power and is considered a major player on the world stage, but its GDP only finds it down at number 44 between Colombia and Chile, and many regions in the country struggle with poverty. That can also be seen in its literacy rate, which only hits 62%. There's a gap between men and women as expected, but this is also due to many of the communities being isolated from the economic centers of the country. The mountainous regions may not even have schools, as parents are left to teach their kids the skills they find relevant. But it's in better shape than many of its neighbors, and recently over a million citizens of Afghani descent have come to the country, along with many Indian Muslims who immigrated during the partition. So what is the largest Muslim country in the world? Number 4. Indonesia Wait, Indonesia? That collection of islands? 
Turns out those islands are some of the busiest in the world, housing a massive population of 270 million. Some of its islands have shared borders, with one being split with Papua New Guinea and the large island of Borneo being split between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. But it still has a lot of real estate on its three main islands, making it the 14th largest country in the world. Only one of its cities is among the largest in the world, Jakarta, coming in at the number 30 spot with a population of over 10 million. And it's still growing. Indonesia is one of the countries with the lowest birth rates on the list, with only 15.3 births and 6.75 deaths per 1,000 residents. It's a very diverse nation with over 1,300 ethnic groups, most of them native Indonesian. The Javanese are the largest group, making up close to half the population, but the country has a wide range of languages and cultures. The one area where they're more homogenous? Religion, with 86% of the population identifying as Muslim, while only 10% identify as Christian. The country has a large ethnic Chinese population, their largest foreign-born group, and that's combining into a fast-growing country. Indonesia's GDP is 17th overall place, making it the 6th largest in Asia. It also has a strong education sector with compulsory education for children through 12th grade. This has resulted in a literacy rate of over 92%, one of the highest in Asia. While many children only attend school part-time, outside the tribal regions there's a strong push toward public education. That's resulted in the country's booming tech sector, with many Indonesian students attending college abroad. While quality of life varies drastically from region to region, the country is a fast-growing power in Asia. Now it's time to talk about the big guns, starting with USA, USA. Number 3. United States of America, USA. We're number 3? Yeah, despite being larger than life in so many ways, the United States isn't actually even close to number one in any category of largest country. With a population of 331 million, it's solidly in third place in numbers and its size matches. Whether it's the third or fourth largest country in the world depends on how you define China's territory. It's so close that disputed territories make the difference. That makes it one of the most spread out countries in the world. As almost all the country is inhabitable, unlike Russia, and its massive swath of Siberian territory where almost no one moves in by choice. With one big exception, of course, a huge part of America's territory is its largest state, way up north in Alaska. It's more than twice the size of any other state, but has one of the smallest populations of any state. The United States has many large metro areas, including eight in the top 80 cities, including New York, the 11th largest city in the world with a population of over 18 million. But its massive territory means its population is spread out among its cities, suburbs, and rural areas pretty evenly. One of the things that makes the U.S. unique is that it has the most distinct state identities of any country, with all 50 states having their own distinct identities and laws and only being vaguely unified at times. But it all comes together into a pretty powerful group. It's probably not a surprise that the United States has the top GDP in the world, with over a quarter of the world's total. It has one of the lower birth rates in the world, though, at 11 births and 10.4 deaths per 1,000 people, keeping it just over breaking even. It's a diverse nation, with the majority of its residents being white, but having significant percentages of black, Latino, and Asian residents. Christianity is its primary religion, but significant minority populations of Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and other faiths are present, and a growing percentage lists their religion as none. While it doesn't have an official language, English dominates, with Spanish becoming an increasingly big fixture in the country. Its literacy rate is around 99%, but only 79% of those are classified as having moderate or high literacy, meaning 21% have only rudimentary literacy skills. But the next two countries are much, much bigger than the USA. Number 2. India not only does India have a larger population than the United States, but it almost quadruples it, with a population of a massive 1.2 billion people. This makes it close to runner-up for the most populous country in the world, and it's expected to climb to number one within the next two years. This is partially due to a high birth rate, although not one of the world's highest. It's at around 16.42 births and 9.45 deaths per 1,000 people. And it has a lot of room to accommodate all those new people. India is a very large country, coming in at seventh place overall between Australia and Argentina. As the second largest country in Asia, it's a powerhouse in more ways than one, and its influence is only growing. In the past, India would have been even larger in territory, but the partitions of what is now Pakistan and Bangladesh in the aftermath of its independence from the Brits reduced its land area quite a bit. Today, it's primarily a Hindu country, although it does have a large group of religious minorities. 14% of its population is Muslim, largely made up of the descendants of those who chose not to leave during the partition. It also has a small Christian, Sikh, and Buddhist minority. Hindi is the most commonly spoken language, with almost half the population speaking it, followed by Bengali and it's a country of dichotomies in more ways than one. 
India has some massive city centers, including nine cities in the top 80, and the second largest city center in the world, Delhi, which houses over 28 million people. However, many of its people still live in small tribal areas, and poverty is commonplace in the country. India has a thriving tech and manufacturing sector and has risen to the fifth largest GDP in the world. Much like Nigeria and Indonesia, its education sector is strong, and a lot of its talent heads to other countries. Other companies commonly outsource their work to India as well, and that's helped by India having a literacy rate of 74%, not one of the highest in the world, but overall strong. India continues to be seen as one of the fastest growing countries in the world, and many predict a bright future for the nation and its people. But for the country in first place, the future is a bit more cloudy. Number 1. China China, the largest country in the world with a population of 1.4 billion people, just under 20% of the global population. It's not pressed for space either, being the third or fourth largest country in the world in terms of space. It's fairly homogenous in terms of ethnicity, with 91% of the population being Han Chinese. In terms of religion, the picture is very mixed. China's communist government heavily discouraged religion for decades, but in recent years, faiths including Buddhism and Chinese ancestor worship have made a comeback, with minorities of Christianity and Islam present. Although the country has a lot of space, a lot of it isn't used up. Much of the population lives in major cities, with the largest being Shanghai, with a population of over 25 million people. These are glitzy, modern metropolitans with a thriving tourism scene. But far away, you can find farmlands and other rural communities, as well as enclaves of minority groups like Uyghurs that are often under assault from the government. But that hasn't stopped China from becoming a global powerhouse. They're the second highest country in the world in terms of GDP, being the only country to even approach the dominance of the US. But under the surface, a lot of trouble is brewing. For decades, China had a one-child policy that was strictly enforced to control its population, and it worked a little too well. China's population declined, and many parents tried to get a boy as their one child, leading to a shortage of women. The policy was eventually reversed, but China still has a low birth rate, only 7.52 births compared to 7.18 deaths per 1,000 people. That has led many to worry about a population bust, but that hasn't stopped China from taking a bigger place on the global stage, both in terms of their economic influence and their aggressive foreign policy moves. With China and India gridlocked over their border disputes, a peaceful resolution isn't in sight. In fact, both nations are bolstering their military presence, which can easily spill over into an all-out war. If these nuclear superpowers clash, the military strength of both nations will decide the extent of the conflict. So which nation has a stronger army, China or India? We'll compare the two countries side by side, starting with India. India's military strength can be determined based on many metrics, but its land forces are one of the most significant elements. Experiencing constant population growth since 1971, India has also raised a number of active duty soldiers. As of today, India has approximately 1.4 million active personnel and 300,000 reserve fighters. If needed, the country can enlist additional troops from a pool of nearly 320 million people available for military service. India has the edge over most other nations in terms of sheer numbers, but it also has a high-quality training program. The country is known for its proficiency in mountain warfare, even having a dedicated high-altitude warfare school, or HAAS, a premier training center that prepares troops for some of the harshest battle environments. The ability of Indian soldiers to protect their homeland at high altitudes has been demonstrated several times throughout history. The most famous example is the battle for the Siachen Glacier, which sits at over 15,000 feet above sea level. This is the highest battlefield on the planet and is characterized by freezing conditions where most people die from the cold rather than gunfire. The unforgiving winter didn't stop Indian troops from prevailing over their opponents in the Siachen conflict, which saw India wage war against Pakistan for a 1,000 square mile territory. The intermittent clashes lasted for nearly 20 years and ended in a resounding victory for India that proved the courage and readiness of its soldiers. Having reliable fighters is essential. Most of the potential war against China will take place throughout the Chinese-Indian border, not just glaciers and other hard-to-reach areas. If India is to stand a chance against China, it needs more than just experienced soldiers. They need an artillery force to match. That's exactly what India has, thanks to its $70 billion military budget. On top of this, the country buys and develops tanks, missile systems, infantry combat vehicles, and other equipment that cements its place as a formidable military power. Let's break down India's military equipment by numbers. Currently, the country has approximately 4,600 tanks, 8,600 armored fighting vehicles, and 2,799 artillery units. But what's under the hood of those war machines? 
Is the technology modern or outdated? As it turns out, India's military equipment is pretty sophisticated. Take the T-90 tanks as an example. Developed and imported from Russia, the T-90 is one of the mightiest battle machines in India's arsenal. The tank's 125mm smoothbore main gun provides tremendous firepower and can fire high-explosive frag ammunition, reflex anti-tank missiles, and armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding sabo rounds. Not only that, but Indian soldiers can replace the tank gun without disassembling the inner turret. This lets them return the tank to action faster and more safely if its main gun is damaged. To complement a high-quality fleet of tanks, India has a reliable system of infantry fighting vehicles. Out of the 8,600 vehicles of the sort, the BMP-2 stands out. With a design similar to its predecessor, the BMP-2 is a serviceable and agile vehicle with a robust engine that's perfect for most missions. It also has reinforced armor, especially in the front, which is typically the most vulnerable part of this type of vehicle. The BMP-2 and most other Indian infantry combat vehicles have exceptional armament. Fitted with a two-man turret, it can take on groups of opponents with relative ease. The vehicle comes with a dual-fed 30mm cannon and a 73mm low-velocity gun. The cannon is especially impressive as it fires armor-piercing high-T and HE frag ammunition. It can obliterate armored targets from 1.5 miles away and ground targets from nearly 3 miles away. India's land troops sound reliable. But what about the country's air defenses? There are several strong points in the country's aviation forces, including 170 fighter aircraft. Most of India's aircraft, like the French Dassault Rafale, are characterized by versatility and interoperability. This means that the jets can easily conduct different kinds of missions and collaborate with allied aircraft. They also come with advanced communication systems to coordinate their assaults with other pilots for maximum efficiency. Another great thing about Indian fighter jets is that they can take on different roles. For example, a pilot can instantly switch the purpose of their plane from strike force to protective missions. Other uses of India's aircraft include reversibility, which is canceling tasks at the very last second and gathering intelligence. Not only that, but India's combat aircraft also has high survivability and the capacity to engage targets in different environments. That's because the jets feature high-efficiency weapon systems and defense measures to keep the enemy from taking them down easily. For instance, if Indian pilots need to defend a base or a strategic area from Chinese planes, they can do so with EM and MICA IR air-to-air -air missiles. Likewise, they can perform ultra-effective precision ground assaults with built-in AASM hammer air-to-surface and scalp EG cruise missiles. Finally, if the goal is to intercept and destroy enemy ships, AM-39 Exocet sea skimming missiles can be the difference maker. If some of the battles in the prospective war against China take place in congested, isolated areas that fighter jets can't access without a runway, India has more than 700 helicopters to deploy. Some of them are utility helicopters designed to transport troops and perform various logistics operations, but others are combat helicopters that can shower the enemy with gunfire and missiles. That's precisely what the MIL Mi-24 does. Imported from Russia, the helicopter is a reliable addition to India's air forces. It has a revamped wing design to maintain the vertical motion of the rotor by about 30% at high speeds and can also hold suspended weapons. It's also equipped with a three-wheel landing gear, double-tiered front leg, and two engines that generate more than 4,000 horsepower combined. As such, the Mi-24 can reach and land in distant areas rapidly and safely. In terms of weaponry, the Mi-24 and many other helicopters in the Indian fleet have revolving turrets with rotating 12.7mm machine guns that can hold well over 1,400 rounds. These are perfect for taking down groups of enemy soldiers in quick succession. India's helicopters also often have four blocks that can hold S5 missiles, four bombs, and many napalm containers. They can even store air-to-ground rockets and anti-tank guided missiles for extra firepower. All of this translates to a powerful force which would definitely carry a heavy burden in the potential war against China. Another branch that would prove invaluable in a war against China is India's naval forces. The ongoing economic development and greater military spending have contributed to a well-balanced navy that's strong on all fronts. India has over 250 naval units, 11 of which are destroyers. This class plays a pivotal role in guarding India's coasts and protecting them from enemy ships. There are many high-end destroyers in India's armada, including INS Visakhapatnam. It's the latest addition to its fleet and represents the pinnacle of the nation's shipbuilding. 
In fact, it's one of the most advanced warships not just in India but anywhere in the world, with a length of 538 feet weighing in at 7,400 tons. It reigns supreme in the Indian Ocean. It's also powered by gas propulsion that features four cutting-edge gas turbines that can propel the warship at about 30 knots or 35 miles per hour. The weaponry of India's destroyers is just as impressive as the rest of the fleet. They're fitted with a wide variety of weapons that include mid-range, surface-to-air missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, torpedo launchers, anti-submarine rocket launchers, and rapid gun mounts, all of which allow India to obliterate a wide range of naval threats. Mighty destroyers aren't the only strength of India's armada. The nation can also deploy more than 10 frigates, 20 corvettes, and 15 submarines to improve its fighting chances. But the undisputed ruler of India's fleet is INS Vikramaditya, a Kiev-class aircraft carrier that struck fear into the hearts of enemies since 2013 when it first entered service. Whether India engages its opponent or has to defend itself, this aircraft carrier can be an ace up its sleeve. It has many destructive missiles, such as surface-to-air projectiles and a variety of high-caliber machine guns. What's also admirable about the vessel is that it can carry up to 36 planes, including 26 Mikoyan multi-role fighters and 10 Kamov helicopters. The impressive armament means that India can not only engage threats but also neutralize attacking enemy troops before they reach their intended targets. And it can do so from pretty much any position. The INS Vikramaditya has powerful engines capable of outputting 180,000 shp or shaft horsepower, enabling the vessel to reach high speeds and support the rest of India's military from different locations. Now you're probably thinking, well-trained soldiers, robust tanks, destructive fighter jets, and a powerful navy are all nice-to-haves, but India is a nuclear force, isn't it? Absolutely. Although India hasn't officially released the size of its nuclear arsenal, some estimates suggest the country has more than 160 warheads at its disposal. These are by far the most powerful weapon in India's military, but we're covering them last since India is unlikely to use them in the potential conflict against China. If either side launched a nuclear warhead, it would probably cause a chain reaction that could plunge the world into World War III, which would end badly for both nations. This wraps up India's military strength. Let's now turn our attention to its rival, China. Although China is known for its technological investments, military spending comprises a large part of its GDP. More specifically, the nation allocated nearly 2% of its GDP to military, giving it a budget of almost $300 billion, which is almost five times more than India. In today's world, the country with the highest defense budget has a stronger military 99% of the time. That seems to be the case when it comes to today's belligerents. But let's analyze China's forces segment by segment to determine if it's true. In terms of manpower, it is no contest. Even though India has surpassed China as the most populated country on the planet, it still has fewer soldiers than China, with over 2 million active soldiers and an additional 2 million reserve personnel China trumps India by a wide margin in this category. The nation can also source more troops if need be. Given that the number of citizens available for conscription is just over 385 million, about 65 million more than what India can work with. Training-wise, China seems to do a good job of preparing its soldiers for an array of combat conditions and environments. The Chinese People's Liberation Army, or PLA, regularly undergoes rigorous training, and its members are renowned for their high discipline. But does discipline translate into combat readiness? It's hard to get a clear picture of how well-trained the Chinese military really is. For one, the communist government rarely discloses details about its army, clouding everyone's perception of its military strength. Some sources say Chinese soldiers are fully-fledged war machines, while others are skeptical of their battle readiness. It seems there's more merit to the latter viewpoint. The reason is simple. The PLA hasn't been in a major battle for over four decades since it clashed with Vietnam in the Sino-Vietnamese War. Even though both sides claimed victory, it's hard to say who prevailed. One thing was certain, the PLA's invasion was far from successful. Vietnam retained its dominion over Cambodia for an additional 10 years and decimated China's military, killing over 30,000 soldiers. The ghost of this conflict still looms over the PLA, and the lack of first-hand combat experience is undeniable. Only a handful of war veterans are still in service, so it's no wonder why many doubt that Chinese soldiers are ready for an all-out war. Even China's official newspaper, People's Liberation Army Daily, is worried about the issue. Conveniently named peace disease, years of peace have resulted in unprecedented economic growth but have also undermined military readiness. 
Even though China had a minor skirmish with its current regional rival in 1988, it's not enough to prepare its infantry for the potential high-altitude battles that it might have to engage in against Indian troops. As a result, if some of the fighting between China and India hinges on infantry only, India's experience with harsh environments and relatively recent combat experience would likely pave its way to victory. But as we all know, modern warfare isn't just about soldiers, sometimes it's all about the machinery. Equipment plays an important role, and China seems to be head and shoulders above India in this respect. The first area where China outperforms India is in the number of tanks. The nation has about 5,750 tanks, which is approximately 1,000 more than the other side. And the technology of their main battle tanks is high level. This is most evident when you take a look at the Chinese Type 99. Featuring reinforced armor, it can withstand the impact of 120mm projectiles with ease. Some even claim that the front of the tank provides as much protection as 1,000mm of steel armor. The vehicle also has NBC protection and modular reactive armor that can be replaced quickly after it's damaged. Chinese tanks aren't just durable when facing direct impact, though. They're equipped with technology that can keep strikes from happening in the first place. For instance, the Type 99 features a laser protection network that utilizes advanced lasers to disrupt incoming missiles. If the enemy deploys gunners with bazookas or observation optics, the tank can use infrared guidance signals to stop the opponent in their tracks. The protection system is also effective against helicopters. To support its tank dominance, China can draw from its stockpile of more than 14,000 infantry combat vehicles, a fleet that's nearly twice the size of India's. There are many highlights of China's infantry battle vehicles, but the ZBD-08 might be the most impressive specimen yet. The Chinese drew inspiration for this vehicle from the Russian BMP-3, and although the Chinese version resembles the BMP-3, it is far more advanced. The unit has a redefined layout that addresses many drawbacks of the Russian version, eliminating the cramped exits and tightly packed troop compartments. It does so by putting the engine in the front and the crew cabins in the back, giving soldiers more room to operate the vehicle. Protection's also been elevated. The ZBD-08 has a steel hull and is compatible with modular armor that can add even more protection. Some suggest that the front arc can endure 30mm armor-piercing projectiles, while the sides neutralize 14.5mm rounds with ease. Like Chinese tanks, this vehicle employs laser protection systems to deter enemy missiles. When it comes to armament, the ZBD-08 and the rest of the Chinese infantry combat vehicles are just as reliable, if not more reliable, than Indian vehicles. China often installs 100mm guns on these vehicles and autoloaders that can zero in on targets from up to 2.5 miles away. The vehicle's weaponry is highly versatile, as it can fire anti-tank and ordinary projectiles to neutralize India's main battle tanks. Given the larger number of tanks and vehicles, it's easy to see why China's equipment more than makes up for its lack of recent experience. The difference between the PLA and India is even more evident when you consider China's Air Force, which consists of about 2,000 more aircraft than India's squadron. Among the aircraft is the high-tech Chengdu J-20 fighter jet. The stealth war machine features supersonic inlet intakes and state-of-the-art low observable exhaust to maximize performance. The central weapon bay houses long-range air-to-air and precision-guided missiles. There are two additional weapons hubs behind the inlets primarily designed for short-range aerial combat. These secondary bays allow the pilot to close the bay door before releasing a missile to enhance stealth and catch the enemy off guard. The PLA is also famous for its world-class helicopters like the Z-10, developed for high-octane air-to-air combat and anti-armor assaults. The helicopter has all it takes to decimate enemies in areas inaccessible to the J-20 and other fighter jets. It comes with a 30mm cannon as well as an HJ-9 anti-tank and TY-90 air-to-air missile to vanquish different types of threats. The Z-10 can even hold rocket pods and boasts armor plates while the sloped sides reduce radar detection. With China's ground and aerial supremacy established, it's time to assess the PLA's naval capabilities. Does India at least stand a chance in this area? Probably not, considering the size of the Chinese Armada. The country has nearly 750 naval units, dwarfing the 250 Indian vessels. The fact that China would emerge victorious in naval combat is even more obvious when you take the technology of the PLA's fleet into account. For example, the Type 55 destroyer is a mighty warship that can annihilate pretty much anything in its path stealthily. The enclosed forecastle conceals its anchor chains, 
mooring points, and other sections that would otherwise alert enemy radars and ships. It's even equipped with advanced smokestack designs that further eliminates the risk of detection and infrared signature. Regarding weapons, it hardly gets any better than Chinese destroyers. With 112 launching cells, the PLA's fleet can fire virtually any type of missiles, including HHQ-9 surface-to-air, YJ-18 anti-ship, CJ-10 land attack, and anti-submarine projectiles. To double down on its naval strength, the PLA can deploy three more aircraft carriers than India, with the highlight being the Fujian. It's the largest of all Chinese carriers and even rivals the USS Ford nuclear-powered vessel. It features electromagnetic catapults to launch heavier aircraft faster, eight oil-fired boilers, and steam turbines that generate a whopping 220,000 horsepower for quick transportation. In the nuclear department, it's estimated China has over 400 nuclear warheads, compared to India's estimated 160. Should the potential war escalate drastically, China would handily overwhelm India. That brings us back to the central question, whose military is more powerful? Without any doubt, China's military is superior to India's, and by a large margin. The only area where India may outperform China is soldier training. Everything else, including tanks, infantry combat vehicles, aircraft, naval forces, and nuclear weapons, favors China. It's a showdown that seemed impossible just a decade ago, but now is more probable than ever before. The US and India, the world's two largest democracies, versus Russia and China, authoritarian states hell-bent on turning the clock back on the liberal-led world order. Who would win this hypothetical World War III? The US and India might seem like an unlikely pairing at first glance. Historically, India has been the leader of the unaligned movement, a small coalition of nations seeking to keep themselves out of the power struggles between the US and the Soviet Union. After the end of the Cold War and with the ascension of China to the world stage, India once more attempted to remain neutral and quickly found out that it couldn't afford to do so. China outclasses India militarily on every level. Chinese technology is better, its combat platforms are more numerous, and its defense budget is many times larger than India's. China also has the advantage of a mediocre but robust domestic arms industry. China may not be pumping out the world's best weapons, but it's capable of creating very advanced weapons domestically, and even has a few items in its arsenal that are global number ones, such as the PL-15 air-to-air missile. India, by comparison, is still struggling to kickstart a domestic arms industry, with its plan to build a domestic main battle tank being seen largely as a disaster across its very long development cycle. Originally meant to enter service in 1985, the Arjun was still in development 26 years later. It remains the only main battle tank in the world whose development spans two separate centuries. Given its inability to confront China in a major peer-on-peer -peer conflict, India has been looking to warm relations between itself and Washington. For its part, the US is happy to cooperate with India and has in fact been looking to do so for decades now. This cooperation could even open the door to solving India's biggest problem today, a lack of modern combat equipment. India has purchased most of its equipment from Russia, but it's never truly received the best stuff. Now India is having serious doubts about the effectiveness of its Russian equipment, given how catastrophically Russian tanks, planes, and helicopters have fared in Ukraine. This has India looking increasingly west for some more advanced equipment, and even before the war in Ukraine, India had already significantly slowed its imports of weapons from Russia, dropping from 64% of all purchases in 2018 to 45% by 2022. Famously, India backed out of joint development of the Su-57 as it became increasingly apparent that the jet was more vaporware than a serious competitor to American fifth-generation fighters. This basically bankrupted Russia's Su-57 efforts, and to this day, the jet only exists in tiny numbers, meant more for demonstrative purposes than actual combat missions. Now, Prime Minister Modi and US President Biden are looking to expand arms sales to India. While India may not be able to face China independently in a full-scale conflict, though, India has two significant advantages going for it. First is its geography. India is immune to invasion from China, and likewise so is China from India. This means that any military ground action will be limited to skirmishes along the mountainous border, and these are skirmishes that unfortunately India is set to lose. However, the loss of border territory in the mountains won't in any way threaten Indian national security, but India's biggest geographic advantage is the fact that it sits directly on China's trade jugular. 
China relies on exports for a significant part of its economy and for approximately 60% of all energy supplies. While most of its exports go to regional neighbors such as Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam, its energy imports from the Middle East travel straight through the Indian Ocean and ultimately the Malacca Straits. India, with its ability to project naval power deep into the Indian Ocean, is well suited for cutting off Chinese energy imports and thus crippling its economy. India is preparing for just a scenario. It currently operates the INS Vikrant aircraft carrier and has a second carrier in construction. Carriers are vitally important for conducting blue water naval operations or operations far from friendly shores. Nations attempting to project power at sea without carrier support risk being destroyed by nations who do operate carriers or simply by long-range attack aircraft using standoff weapons. India is also building military bases in the islands near the Malacca Straits themselves. A new naval base at Grand Nicobar Island sits directly at the mouth of the Malacca Straits and caused a diplomatic uproar in China when construction began. For their part, India began construction not just to secure this strategically important waterway, but to be taken more seriously by a Beijing growing increasingly belligerent. The Grand Nicobar facility has been likened to a guillotine placed directly over China's exposed and very long neck, stretching from its southern shores all the way to the Middle East. India's second strength is its combat experience. India and Pakistan have had a number of wars, with them typically going very poorly for Pakistan. Even now, combat against Pakistan-backed groups continues along the border regions across the west and northwest India, and that has helped hone the Indian military into a competent force. Pakistan may pose a significantly less capable threat than China, but that still means that the Indian military has had multiple opportunities to cut its teeth in war and learn from the lessons real combat teaches. This isn't just about tactics and doctrine, though. It's everything, including experience with combat resupply and logistics, and all one needs to do is look at the Russian offensive on Kyiv to realize just how important having a good combat logistics force really is. China, on the other hand, has waged no war since its failed invasion of Vietnam in the 70s. Even after being weakened by the war against the US-backed South Vietnam and its American allies, Vietnam managed to soundly defeat the Chinese offensive, grinding it to a halt. Weeks later, it was forced to retreat, while claiming it had achieved all strategic objectives and had thus won the war. If China's strategic objective was to send a considerable military force into a brief camping trip deep in the rainforest, it had indeed won the war. But by all international accounts, Vietnam soundly defeated China. The Chinese military of today is not the one of the 1970s, though, and China has invested heavily into modernizing. That doesn't mean, however, that China will perform well in a real combat situation. Until only recently, its military conducted almost exclusively highly choreographed and rehearsed exercises for the benefit of watching dignitaries. In one specific incident in the 2010s, entertainers had to be flown in to lift the morale of the troops undertaking one of China's first realistic training exercises. In 2014, the Chinese military increased its budget to be spent on entertainment for its troops in an effort to boost morale. This included the purchasing of jukeboxes and musical instruments. Now boosting the morale of your troops is never a bad idea, but compare this with similar programs in the US military which focus on building entertainment facilities, family recreation centers, and social programs for their service members. Jukeboxes and guitars will only get you so far, and even more telling is where the funds for this morale boost was coming from, funds typically used by high-ranking military and political officials to do everything from going on lavish vacations to visiting high-end luxury clubs. Fundamentally, this is one of China's own biggest weaknesses, corruption. Russia is famously corrupt by design. Rather than have a political and military culture that is corrupt, its political and military culture is corruption. Corruption is a means to an end in Russia, with it serving as leverage over officials lower ranking than yourself. It ensures the loyalty of subordinates up and down the chain of command, who could have their well-documented corruption used against them to remove them from their positions. This culture of corruption extends to the lowest levels of the Russian military, where unit commanders skim off their soldiers' paychecks and those soldiers in turn take it out on fresh conscripts or recruits. China too has a corruption problem, but it would be more fair to call it efficient corruption, at least in the political sector. Kickbacks and payouts serve to lubricate the wheels of China's meteoric modernization, even if they fundamentally undermine Chinese society itself. 
In China, only efficient corruption is tolerated, unlike in Russia where there's little regard for the effects of the corruption and its cost is actually baked into the purchasing price of things like military equipment. The reason it was cheaper for Russia to buy drones abroad rather than build its own at home before the Ukraine war was because the various kickbacks expected by officials down the acquisitions chain made it three to four times more expensive to buy the product from domestic sources. But there's a limit on how efficient corruption can be, and Chinese society is rife with it simply because, like Russia, corruption was how the game was played for decades. Recently, the head of China's largest military shipbuilder was charged with multiple corruption charges. In 2020, Hu Wenming was arrested on a number of charges, but this was merely the tip of the iceberg that persists to this day. In 2015, Chinese Communist Party anti-corruption investigators visited the China Shipbuilding Industry Corporation, or CSIC, and discovered a laundry list of offenses, including lack of oversight by party and discipline inspection organizations, violation of regulation among research institutes, incomplete financial records, exchanging of bribes for research funding, redirecting research projects to private companies, sale of company resources and technology for personal gain, using one's position to benefit businesses of family and friends, violation of party rules, and incomplete regulations on personnel selection and appointment. Two years later, they returned, but not much had changed. Cronyism and favoritism was rampant, and company officials used their position for personal gain. Inspectors returned a third time in 2019 to find that yet again not much had changed. The investigations did produce arrests. Ironically, the first arrest would be Liu Shanghong, the C6 anti-corruption czar. A deputy of CSIC chairman Hu Wenming was found guilty of accepting bribes and abuse of power that led to, quote, very serious damage to China's national interests. This type of corruption is cancerous to the military that industries like this directly support. The quality of equipment received by the People's Liberation Army Navy was affected by the siphoning of funds intended for R&D or manufacture to personal bank accounts. Further, this hurt the CSIC's ability to keep the plan competitive by directly affecting company culture. Cronyism meant that less qualified individuals were put in positions of power, directly affecting the company's efficiency and resulting in a significant drop in morale among subordinates. Review of CSIC on Chinese job sites frequently mentioned disappointment over mismanagement and cronyism across the spectrum of CSIC subsidiaries and research institutes. It also doesn't help when some of your most senior officials are directly selling secrets to foreign intelligence agencies. But this culture of mismanagement and cronyism is endemic to Chinese military culture as well. For decades, military appointments largely came about as a result of China's gift culture, wherein a subordinate seeking a promotion or favor would provide a superior lavish gift or favor. This culture was endemic well into the 21st century, and despite efforts by Xi Jinping to root out corruption, remains to this day. This means that a significant number of senior Chinese military leaders are unlikely to be best qualified for their positions, and that's a problem when facing off against a professional and highly competitive force like the U.S. military. In 2021, 70 serving and retired senior People's Liberation Army officers were demoted for pay-for-promotion schemes, including a full general and two lieutenant generals. Most of these officers were directly connected to the PLA Chief Joint of Staff, Fang Fenghui who was himself convicted of taking bribes and sentenced to life in prison. But the chain of corruption doesn't stop there, because Feng Hui was directly connected to Guo Bujong and Zhu Kaihu, former vice chairman of the Central Military Commission and who were both punished but not removed for corruption. And like Russia, the corruption extends to the lowest levels of the Chinese military, though perhaps not as brutally. New recruits, especially those from rural areas, will pay bribes to enlistment officers who then boost their entrance exams or overlook physical and mental issues that would normally bar one from military service. This means that a significant number of Chinese recruits may themselves not be fully qualified for the positions they hold. But even more importantly, means that the culture of corruption is alive and well inside the Chinese armed forces. And one only need to look at Ukraine to see how corruption destroys a military's ability to fight a high-intensity conflict against a serious adversary motivated to kick your teeth in, which is exactly the scenario that China faces in any showdown in the Pacific against Taiwan, Japan, and the US. As China's partner, Russia likely presents more of a liability than a boon at this point. The nation has proven to be incapable of fighting a modern combined arms conflict, 
And most telling of all is the incredibly outsized impact that a minuscule amount of advanced Western equipment has had on the war. In the summer of 2022, the US sent a handful of HIMARS batteries to Ukraine and absolutely turned the war on its head for the Russians. HIMARS was instrumental in shaping the coming fall counteroffensive, and the addition of just a dozen long-range precision strike platforms to the conflict completely disrupted Russian operations across the front. For comparison, the US has over 400 of its own HIMARS batteries still in its inventory, a threat that it's safe to say Russia would absolutely crumble under if the two sides ever came to blows. With its military hopelessly bogged down in Ukraine, there's little that Russia could offer China in terms of a shared conflict against a US-Indian alliance. Such a conflict would play out largely over the air-sea domains, and Russia's navy would be able to offer at best modest assistance, while leaving its own coasts vulnerable to US attack. The effectiveness of its aerospace forces are also dubious. Russia's air force has been largely absent from the fight in Ukraine, with the nation using only a portion of its air force for combat operations. The mystery would be revealed when data leaked to the West that Russia was having a serious problem fielding qualified pilots and was being forced to send senior instructors to the conflict, compounding its inability to field more pilots by taking away experienced training personnel and more often than not getting them killed. Russian pilots are believed to be receiving only between 70 to 120 hours of flight time a year, and their training program fares even worse. At the Krasnodar Higher Military Aviation School for Pilots, graduates average only 140 hours of beginner flight training with another 60 hours in an advanced flight training program for about 200 total hours before joining a combat-ready squadron. This pales in comparison to the training that American pilots receive who fly even more hours before climbing into a training fighter jet. In the US Air Force, pilots attend initial flight screening, where they accumulate 25 hours of flight time in prop-driven aircraft. Then a pilot will undergo specialized undergraduate pilot training, which couples classroom instruction with 90 hours of flights in another prop-driven aircraft. Then after about 115 flight hours in training, Air Force pilots are assigned the aircraft they'll be flying while in active service. Fighter and bomber pilots who make up only the top students of a class fly 100 plus hours in a jet training aircraft in their next phase of training. By now, American trainee pilots have already flown more hours than their Russian counterparts and won't even be combat ready until they fly an additional 20 hours in their introduction to fighter fundamental course and then between 6 months and a year with their dedicated airframe. By the time a US pilot reaches their combat ready squadron, they already have as many flight hours as a Russian veteran. And it's not just a pilot crisis on Russia's hands, it's the inability to conduct joint operations alongside air defenses. In the Ukraine conflict, Russia has shot down nearly as many of its own aircraft as Ukraine has, all due to its inability to deconflict the airspace over the battlefield. To better put this in perspective, in Desert Storm, the US successfully deconflicted Iraqi airspace, suffering only a handful of friendly on friendly incidents despite 4,000 coalition aircraft operating over the country. By comparison, Russia is operating a few hundred platforms in airspace half the size and scoring nearly as many kills as Ukraine is on its own airframes. This puts the possibility of Russian and Chinese air forces working together at nearly zero. Assuming the conflict remained conventional, it would be on China to do the lion's share of the fighting against a joint Indian and American force. The US is well accustomed to operating alongside partner nations and is much better suited at deconfliction and cooperation than China or Russia, allowing India to use significant amounts of air power in the Pacific theater where it would play a more meaningful role than over the mountainous northern border which is heavily defended by Chinese ground defenses and lacks truly strategically important targets. Under the cover of American carrier battle groups, Indian ships could provide a significant boost to the US capabilities, especially after accounting for the loss of multiple platforms due to very dense Chinese anti-ship defenses. It's safe to say that without India's navy shoring up its numbers, the US navy's own entry into the Pacific theater would be significantly delayed as it weathered the storm of the People's Liberation Army rocket forces and conventional anti-ship missiles. Ultimately though, it's India's strategic position at the mouth of the Straits of Malacca and the US's ability to project power into the Gulf of Oman that would spell China's defeat. From these two choke points, the Allies could effectively cut off Chinese energy imports and with crippling strikes against pipelines from Russia using submarine-launched cruise missiles and America's fleet of stealth bombers, China's energy imports would slow to a trickle, paralyzing its economy. Forced to severely ration energy in order to supply the war effort, China would face a domestic crisis as its massive population chafes under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. In the end, 
A U.S.-Indian alliance is simply too powerful for a Sino-Russian alliance to overcome, and their growing partnership could ensure that China's ambitions to dominate Asia and upset the liberal world order remains nothing but a pipe dream. Indian soldiers scream at the top of their lungs for the approaching Chinese forces to halt. The air is thin and crisp atop the peaks of the Himalayas. Both sides are armed with machine guns, but no one raises their weapons in fear that if any shots are fired, it could lead to all-out war. An Indian soldier lashes out with a long stick and strikes a Chinese man across the face. All is silent as the Chinese soldier stumbles back in shock. He places his hand on his cheek, looks across the line of actual control, and orders his troops to attack. A brawl breaks out. This scenario occurred near the small Himalayan town of Tuang in the Arunachal Pradesh region of India. The aggression is the result of 60 years of disagreement over the borders in the region. The line of actual control separates Arunachal Pradesh from Tibet, which the Chinese government sees as its territory. However, since the line was first drawn by the British during their colonization of India, this boundary has shifted, been fought over, and almost led to a war a number of times. The bloodiest battle over the region started on October 23, 1962. It's the early morning. The sun has just started to peek its head over the tops of the Himalayas. The mist rises from the high-altitude grasses as Indian soldiers prepare to change shifts. Suddenly, the far-off sound of artillery fire echoes off the cliff face. The Indian soldiers dive into their trenches and shells rain down from the sky. They peer over the top of the dirt to sight the enemy as the dust settles. They have orders to protect the border but are hesitant to launch their own offensive until Central Command gives the order. As the dust settles, shouting can be heard from across the line of actual control. A contingent of Chinese soldiers runs toward the entrenched Indian forces with their guns raised. Shots ring out as the Indian border guards open fire on the incoming Chinese forces. Bullets rip through flesh. Bayonets slice into the enemy. The butts of guns slam into faces. It's chaos. The Indian soldiers are overrun. 17 men are dead and another 13 were captured by the Chinese invasion force. The remaining Indian soldiers fall back to the nearby Buddhist monastery at Tawang. The following day, the Chinese appear at the gates of the monastery. They outnumber the Indian force and are better equipped. The peace and tranquility of the monastery is shattered as Chinese troops force their way in and capture the temple. From Tawang, the Chinese forces march further south. They claim village after village. It seems as if nothing can stop them. This could be the beginning of a Chinese occupation of India. Small skirmishes break out across the region. Indian soldiers try to mount a resistance, but the mountains make this area incredibly hard to get to. There's no telling when reinforcements will arrive. The Chinese soldiers continue to march south toward Assam, one of the region's wealthiest and most important settlements. It's here that there are vibrant tea gardens, rich oil fields, and jute plantations used to produce cord. India is in big trouble. It seems they're about to lose an entire region of the country to their adversaries. Then, just under a month after Chinese forces crossed the line of actual control, they begin to retreat back to their side of the border. On November 21, 1962, the Chinese declare a ceasefire, and the war to control the Himalayas comes to a swift end. All indications pointed to the Chinese being successful in occupying Arunachal Pradesh. They had taken numerous mountain villages and towns. The Indian military couldn't believe the Chinese had just given up for no apparent reason. 1,383 Indian soldiers were killed in the brief war. Around 1,700 went missing in the treacherous landscape of the Himalayan mountains. Chinese records indicate that their forces killed 4,900 Indian soldiers and citizens and captured another 3,968. However, actual numbers are likely somewhere between the two nations' reports. To this day, no one except for the Chinese government knows why their troops were recalled. Maybe they had other plans, or perhaps the Chinese military thought they had overextended themselves and couldn't resupply their troops. Yet, even though the Chinese could have taken the Arunachal Pradesh region off of India in 1962, they didn't. Which seems odd, as there would be continued fighting along the border for decades to come. Fast forward to 1987. Indian officials make Arunachal Pradesh a state. The Chinese government is furious over the official status change of the region. Until that point, both sides claimed the territory for themselves, but no official change in the region's status had occurred. Now that it was official, India flooded the region with new defenses and infrastructure. Even with India officially incorporating the region into its borders as a state, fights continue to break out along the border with China. Arunachal Pradesh might have been part of India, but the exact location of the border running through the Himalayas between it and Tibet was still unclear. In 2008, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited Arunachal Pradesh, China threw a hissy fit. 
Singh announced that India would embark on a series of road-building projects to better connect the region to the rest of the country. Even with most nations around the world recognizing Arunachal Pradesh as part of India, China still calls the region South Tibet and has renamed several towns on the Indian side of the border, saying that they rightfully belong to China. Tensions continued to rise throughout the 2000s and in 2020, violence broke out along the border once again. The current problem and the problems of the past are due to the fact that a colonizing power established the line of actual control without much thought or any real plan of how the border would be enforced in the future. Ever since it was established in 1959 by the British, there's been fighting over who controls the region. However, there is something else happening, and it's the fault of almost every nation on the planet. The world is changing and it's not just because of geopolitical turmoil. The environment and landscape of the Himalayas and the rest of the world have been altered by climate change. However, in regions with extreme ecosystems such as the High Himalayas, the environment is changing more rapidly than the rest of the world. The snowpacks and glaciers are melting, revealing new landscapes. As the climate shifts, so does the environment, and what were once natural boundaries along the line of actual control, such as rivers, lakes, and snow caps. This obviously complicates things even further, as the border becomes fluid, and there's no definitive boundary that India and China can agree on. Because of this new uncertainty, the area has become more and more dangerous for civilians and soldiers alike. In June of 2020, a vicious battle broke out in the Galwan Valley of the Ladakh region, where 20 Indian soldiers and at least four Chinese died. A contingent of Chinese troops wades through the river running between the Galwan Valley. Word has reached Indian forces that the Chinese are on the move. It's an uncertain situation as the valley has changed slightly over the years, but the Indians are adamant that this part of Ladakh is under their control. An Indian force moves in to intercept the advancing Chinese. They hope that a conflict can be avoided, so rather than fully arming themselves, the Indian soldiers carry clubs with nails in them, sturdy sticks, and rocks to fight back the Chinese troops. The Indian soldiers round a bend in the river. A group of dozens of Chinese soldiers is coming toward them. Their commanding officer advances to discuss the situation with one of the Chinese captains. They meet in the middle of the stream. The Indian officer asks what's going on and tells the Chinese commander to halt his troops. He doesn't listen. The Chinese soldier shoves the Indian officer, pushing him backward. The two sides begin shouting at one another. It's not clear who throws the first punch or lashes out with the first stick, but fighting erupts. The Indian soldiers charge forward with their nail-studded clubs. The Chinese forces use riot gear to protect themselves against the deadly attack. Blood spills into the river, turning its waters red. Chinese soldiers at the front of the pack are bludgeoned to death, even as they use their own clubs and knives to rip through the ranks of Indian soldiers. In the chaos, a young Chinese fighter falls into the icy water. He's dragged under by his heavy gear and drowns. The soldiers pull back from one another, collecting their wounded as they retreat. Neither side is victorious. The Chinese proceed back toward their territory and the Indians regroup. Later, the governments will give the dead soldiers posthumous awards and tensions will continue to rise in the region. After close to 45 years of relative stability along the contested border, blood has been shed once again. And in only a couple of years' time, the two countries may be on the brink of war once again. In January 2021, another rumble broke out between the Chinese and Indian troops. Once again, it was over a disagreement about where the border actually is. But this time, the dispute was in India's Sikkim state, which sits between Bhutan and Nepal. The dispute was relatively calm compared to the bloody battle that had occurred several months before. Both sides agreed to disengage from the region and return to their respective sides. However, as 2022 came to a close, Chinese troop numbers started to grow near the region of Arunachal Pradesh once again. This wasn't just a redeployment of soldiers, it seemed to be a mass mobilization. The increase in troops was preceded by a massive road-building project in the Chinese-controlled region of Tibet. It was becoming clear that the network of roads being constructed was a way for the Chinese military to move troops throughout the region more easily. Every week, more and more Chinese soldiers arrived near the line of actual control. Winter in the Himalayas was just beginning when the conflict started to brew. Outside of Tawang and the Buddhist temple that had once been captured by Chinese forces in 1962, Indian soldiers prepare themselves for battle. Reports are coming in that the Chinese troops are encroaching on the line of actual control. There is uneasiness across the world as the war in Russia continues to rage. Peace on planet Earth seems to be an all-but-forgotten concept by now. Indian forces are unsure what the Chinese soldiers are planning to do, but with Russia invading its neighbor, China might have ambitions of its own. Indian soldiers mobilize across the region. December 9th is a chilly day. The Indian soldiers can see their breath rising into the heavens as they wait for the approaching enemy. They dig in at a small village called Yangtze. Of course, the Chinese claim this village is part of their territory. The line dividing their two sides is so ambiguous that many of the villages in the region have two names. 
one given to them by India and another by the Chinese government. The battle at Galwan Valley is still fresh in everyone's minds. Indian troops are prepared for anything this time, which means when the Chinese soldiers are spotted, they do not wait for diplomatic intervention. Instead, India gets ready for battle. Since the bloody conflict a couple of years back, the Indian military has implemented new tactics. Now when the Chinese forces become aggressive, there's a second layer of troops ready to deploy to the border to aid those who are on patrol. This is known as a quick reaction team, and they've already arrived in Tawang. The Chinese are within striking distance. Both sides begin to shout at one another. Once again, sticks and clubs are drawn to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Indian troops charge the Chinese soldiers walking toward them. They're not prepared for this. In the initial panic, several soldiers are injured as sticks crack against bodies and clubs thud into armor. The Chinese force immediately disengages and retreats back across the border. Immediately after the retreat, a Chinese commander approaches the border with a sign of peace. An Indian officer goes to meet him. They discuss the disagreement at length and decide to stand down and restore peace and tranquility to the area. When the Indian parliament addresses the conflict, they conclude that China's actions were an encroachment on their territory to change the status quo in the region. It's not enough to launch a war, but it's enough to bring in another major player to keep an eye on the conflict, the United States. China responds by claiming that India has been building too much infrastructure along the border and that some projects are crossing into Chinese territory. Beijing is under the delusion that Indian soldiers are constantly trespassing and infringing on China's domain. And while it's true that India is upgrading the infrastructure along the border, it's only doing so to connect the region of the country to other major infrastructure around it. The Chinese and Indian governments agree to disagree. The exact location of the border and who controls which pieces of land are still in dispute. The scary thing is, is that if one side becomes too aggressive, it could lead to a war between the two nations. And since both have large armies, powerful vehicles, and nuclear capabilities, a war between China and India could throw the entire region into chaos. So the question becomes, why has China been so aggressive in the region lately? For decades, there seemed to be relative peace, and the landscape of the Himalayas can be incredibly harsh and inhospitable. What has driven Chinese forces to test their luck against the Indian military? Some analysts believe it has to do with a location called Aksai Chin. This region is known for its ice desert, which is rich in minerals. China might hope that India will formally give them control of the area, and in return they could accept Arunachal Pradesh as belonging solely to India. This would result in less conflict in these two areas, but as of right now, it seems that neither side is willing to make the concession. Another theory is that China is keeping the border conflict alive for its own sinister plans. China might not even care about the contested regions in the Himalayas. Instead, they want the Indian military to devote resources and men there, which will allow China to become more dominant in other parts of Asia. The more attention India gives to the Arunachal Pradesh region, the less infrastructure and expansion they'll carry out in other parts of the country. China might hope that this will dial back India's ambitions. They may also expect that if there is an ongoing conflict in India, the United States may be more hesitant to strengthen ties with the country out of uncertainty for the future. However, if this was China's plan, it does not seem to be working. After hostilities broke out in December 2022, the United States reacted by doubling down its support for India. The Biden administration offered to send advanced military equipment and resources, citing China's actions as being provocative. The US also said it would ramp up its intelligence sharing with India as well which it had done previously during prior conflicts. So, if China's plan was to deter U.S. involvement in the region, it certainly backfired. China likely sees India as its biggest rival in Asia. Both countries have similar-sized populations, although Chinese manufacturing capabilities are currently much more advanced than India's. Investments by U.S. companies and other national corporations might allow India to become a major tech manufacturing hub in the coming years. India also has a formidable navy and with the aid of the United States could grow its ground strength considerably. It's also no secret that the United States and India have close ties in several business sectors that could help both nations gain more power and influence in Asian markets. The closer the US and India become, the worse things will get for China. And the Chinese government knows this, so they might be provoking India to see how the US will react. Unfortunately for China, it didn't go as they hoped. Then again, maybe the most recent Chinese incursions into Indian territory were a way for them to voice their displeasure. The timing of the incident occurred one month after Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi met at the G20 summit in Bali. This was also only one week after the US-India military exercise called Yud Abyas 2022, a war simulation and preparation exercise that was almost certainly based around a larger conflict with China. Part of this war exercise occurred in the high altitudes of India's Uttarakhand state which is not only on the Chinese border but also contains similar terrain to the territory that is disputed 
around the line of actual control. Perhaps China might have been showing India and the US that it too could conduct military exercises in the mountains of the Himalayas, or perhaps China was just showing their displeasure about war exercises happening so close to their borders. It's hard to say what the exact reason for the Chinese military overstep in the Arunachal Pradesh region was, since the government hasn't made any type of clear statement about the incident other than it was protecting its borders. Less likely, but also a possibility for why Chinese troops crossed the border, is that they might have been probing Indian defenses. Maybe they're curious if their forces could just march into the Arunachal Pradesh and seize the region as they did back in 1962. Clearly, this is no longer the case, and the backlash from the US in the form of ramping up their intelligence sharing and military aid to India is a clear indication that any invasion would be met with a swift repercussion. A more likely reason for the probing into Indian territory has to do with the distraction tactic. Again, if India is focused on the land borders of the Himalayas, it might spend less time and resources on its maritime capabilities. China might have been trying to point out that India's borders to the north are still vulnerable in the hopes that they'd send more troops and invest more money into that region of the country. China might not be interested in Arunachal Pradesh at all, but most certainly cares about controlling the waters off the coast of Asia. The waterways connecting the Pacific and Indian Oceans are incredibly important for trade. China likely doesn't want anyone contesting its cargo ships or naval vessels from freely moving about the seas, and right now the only country in the region that could even come remotely close to matching their maritime capabilities is India. There's very little chance that China is planning a war with India. There's an even smaller chance that they will invade from Tibet and proceed through the difficult terrain of the Himalayas. Therefore, the skirmishes that have broken out along the border of Arunachal Pradesh are most likely just the Chinese government's way of voicing its displeasure. Then again, it could just be the complete incompetence of Chinese forces stationed in the region that has led to this conflict. Maybe they really don't know where the border is. This is probably not the last brawl containing sticks and clubs that'll break out along the ambiguous line of actual control. Luckily, these skirmishes also likely won't ignite a full-blown war between the two nuclear powers either. A Chinese submarine lurks below the waters of the Indian Ocean. Suddenly, an explosion rocks the vessel. An anti-submarine torpedo has struck the stern. Water begins rushing in as compartments are sealed. The Chinese crew blows the ballasts. They need to surface now, or the submarine will sink to the ocean floor, crushing all who are inside. The torpedo was launched from the newly deployed Indian Anti-Submarine Warfare Shallow Watercraft Corvette. It's been tracking the Chinese intruder for several hours. The sub sends an emergency message for help back to China as it breaks the surface. The People's Navy deploys to the region. As it passes through the Malacca Strait, Indian destroyers, frigates, and aircraft carriers lie in wait at several choke points. The vessels unload their cannons, missiles, and torpedoes. The trapped Chinese ships are decimated. This hypothetical scenario may happen in the future, and it might be closer than you think. But thanks to one specific set of islands, India might have the advantage if China ever tries to expand its influence further into the Indian Ocean. The chain known as the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are in one of the most strategically significant locations in the world. This bit of land may hold the key to balancing the powers rising in South and East Asia. For decades, India has been slowly militarizing the island chain. But progress has been slow. That all might change in the coming years, as China tries to expand its influence further south and west. India is feeling the pressure both economically and to their national security. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands are their best chance of securing the waters along India's coastline while monitoring the shipping routes that much of the traffic in the region uses. This includes Chinese vessels, which is why these Indian islands have Beijing very worried. It probably goes without saying that India and China don't have the best relationship. There are constant clashes between the troops along their borders in the Himalayas, as there's never been an agreement over exactly where India ends and Chinese-controlled Tibet begins. Conflict between the two nations is only exacerbated by both governments trying to boost their economies while becoming more influential on a global scale. It's these two nations who are fighting for supremacy in East and Southeast Asia as they grow in strength. However, in terms of global economic power, the waterways between China and India are key. Both countries have formidable armies and navies, but for China, it's imperative that they have access to the Indian Ocean for several reasons. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands could really put a damper on China's plans for the future. The key here is to remember that whoever controls the Malacca Strait controls the main waterway that ships use to move goods and supplies between the Indian Ocean and East Asia. This includes goods from Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. Right now, India is in a position to be the dominant player in controlling the area thanks to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. 
Let's look at the history, importance, and strategic significance of the islands. As we dive deeper into this region of the world, it'll become glaringly clear why China is so terrified that India is increasing the militarization of the Andaman and Nicobar chain. It's very possible that what India does in the coming year could directly impact China's ability to spread its influence in the region. In a worst-case scenario, these islands might be ground zero for an all-out conflict between India and China. The island chain itself is 22 nautical miles from Myanmar and only 90 miles from Indonesia. This allows India's navy and aircraft to have quick and easy access to not only the Bay of Bengal, but the 6-degree and 10-degree channels, through which around 60,000 vessels pass each year. The importance of this region cannot be overstated, as Chinese trading ships require access to these waters, otherwise a large part of their trade network would come screeching to a halt. To put it into perspective, China receives around three-quarters of all of its oil from trade routes running through the Indian Ocean. If they were to lose access to these shipping lanes, it would be devastating for their economy and infrastructure. If we go back in time, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands have always been a strategically important location. Chinese Buddhist monks of the 7th century, Arab travelers hundreds of years ago, and even Marco Polo visited the islands. This is because they serve as a vital stopping point while traveling through the waters connecting the Indian and Pacific Oceans. When the British colonized India, they turned the Andaman Islands into a penal colony. The use by the British pushed indigenous communities out and eventually led to the establishment of Port Blair, which now contains a naval base and airfield. When India gained its independence in 1947, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands were officially incorporated into their borders. Over the years, the islands have developed into a popular tourist destination for people in the region. However, it's not the growing tourism industry that China is worried about, it's the growing military presence that concerns them. Over the last couple of decades, China has been increasingly trying to expand its influence in the Indian Ocean. They've deployed expeditionary naval forces, conducted arms sales, and made strategic connections with other nations throughout the region. This obviously worried India, which then forced the government to seek out ways to bring Chinese expansion to a stop or at least slow it down. It quickly became apparent that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands could be the answer to India's problems. Its location allows for the monitoring of the different waterways in the region along with large areas of the mainland. China's used the guise of anti-piracy operations to send submarines and naval vessels into the waters off the coast of India. They've also established bases in places like Gwadar and Djibouti to increase their military presence in the Indian Ocean, but China's been expanding its naval operations closer to India's borders as well. For example, Chinese naval and survey vessels have been sighted in the Andaman Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and even in India's exclusive economic zone. It's clear that China is becoming more aggressive in its actions in the South China Sea along with parts of South Asia. They constructed artificial islands where they deployed military personnel and assets, and this has been a huge cause of concern for nations like Taiwan. But there's also a real concern that the militarization of the South China Sea could cause irreparable harm to the freedom of navigation rules in the Indo-Pacific region. This open trade agreement is vital to maintaining peace and political stability in the area. India has been keeping a close eye on China's actions in the South China Sea and is planning for a future where China starts expanding into the Andaman Sea or the Bay of Bengal. China is already engaged in illegal and unregulated fishing practices in the areas, which is a resource vital to India and other countries in the region that border the ocean. For years, China has been pushing its luck to see how much it can get away with. India has become fed up and is starting to take more drastic actions by using the Andaman and Nicobar Islands to strengthen their position and keep China in check. The increase of military assets being deployed to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands is taking their time. More naval ships and personnel are deployed on the islands every year in preparation for a more aggressive stance in the waters of the region. At Point Blair, the small military base is being reimagined as an intelligence hub where aircraft, ships, and communication airways can set up to gather more intel about China's military movements. This strategic listening post will provide India with the upper hand in the region especially if they need to take naval action, which is obviously a cause of concern for China. As the Andaman and Nicobar Islands become more of a military asset to India, China's ability to push the boundaries of where their ships and aircraft can go without repercussions diminishes. In the future, the intelligence gathered by radar and listening posts on the islands could inform not just the Indian military, but other nations who might also have interests to protect in the region, such as Australia, Japan, and even the US. But with the ability to gather more intelligence, India also needs to be able to control what's happening in the area. One key aspect of this is promoting the island chain as an economic hub and port for trade ships. This is why India has plans to build a major port at Great Nicobar Island that's estimated to cost $1.5 billion. 
And for China, any country that poses a threat to its economic might is a country that they will look to punish. If India is successful in creating a major transshipment port on the Andaman and Nicobar island chain, Chinese ships will likely need to utilize it to maintain certain trade agreements. Since India is already battling an economic war to secure jobs, resources, and manufacturing contracts with China, the leadership of the People's Republic is probably less than thrilled that they might have to use Indian-controlled ports in the future. If India can entice the international community to use their ports in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, it could allow them to gain a substantial piece of the enormous amount of trade that's done with China. This will also allow India and the countries they're close to to control supply chains, which might allow sanctions on China to be more easily enforced. The repercussions of this reality could be disastrous for the Chinese economy. China is likely extremely worried about how India's ports in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will affect their ability to procure resources from Africa and Europe. But there's also another issue for China if the islands become a mainstream stop for vessels passing through the region. Southeast Asian nations such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore rely heavily on Chinese goods. However, if there's easier access to global markets, they might start trading with other parts of the world. No matter how China looks at it, if the Andaman and Nicobar Islands become economic and shipment hubs, their own trade network could be put into jeopardy. And if all of this wasn't enough, now the quadrilateral security dialogue between Australia, India, Japan, and the United States has resulted in military exercises being conducted near the islands. These exercises are identifying shortcomings in India's ability to successfully protect its waterways, and allowing for future plans to defend and control all major channels running through the region to be more effective. However, a big problem is becoming increasingly clear to India as it tries to strengthen its position, and China is almost certainly aware of it. When comparing India's naval capability with China, there's a huge gap. China has the largest navy in the world, and we all know from the war in Ukraine, having more military vessels does not necessarily mean a nation will be able to win a war. However, numbers are definitely on China's side at the moment. According to estimates, China has around 730 naval vessels, while India has about 295. Both countries have two aircraft carriers, but India is vastly outnumbered in every other type of naval vessel. China has 50 destroyers, 43 frigates, 72 corvettes, and 78 submarines. India, on the other hand, has 11 destroyers, 12 frigates, 19 corvettes, and 18 submarines. You can see the massive disparity between the two forces, but, and this is a big but, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands could help negate the differences in numbers due to its strategic location. Even if a large Chinese fleet was able to traverse the Malacca Strait, India would still have several choke points around the islands that could be used to counteract the numbers of China's navy. If the Chinese Navy was drawn too close to the islands, India could launch missiles, rockets, and artillery from the shoreline to cause massive damage. On top of this, if China becomes too aggressive, the joint missions being conducted as a result of the quadrilateral security dialogue means that India will likely receive some help from one or all of the nations that they conduct exercises with. In recent years, China has been using one of their favorite tactics to try to gain the upper hand in the waters around India. Misdirection and straight-up lies are employed to draw attention away from what they're really doing. When India started deploying more ships and military personnel to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, China deployed submarines to the area. This was done to gather information, but when China was caught in Indian waters, they claimed ignorance and said that the misplaced submarine had nothing to do with India's deployment of military assets to Andaman and Nicobar. The Chinese Defense Ministry also said that the People's Liberation Army often cooperates with other militaries in the region, including India, which only added positive factors for regional peace and stability. What China was really doing was responding to India's naval deployment in the Andaman Sea. And when they got caught, Chinese leadership made up some BS to try and distract from the fact that they were in India's territory. This has happened time and time again, such as in the waters around Taiwan, the Himalayan border with India, and anywhere else China has a military presence. These operations are called gray zone tactics, in which China uses disruptive measures and aggression that doesn't result in war, but is not appropriate during peacetime either. Naval incursions into Indian territory, the setting up of naval bases in the Indian Ocean, and conflicts along the Himalayan border are all gray zone initiatives that China's using to weaken or threaten India. To counteract China's constant encroachments and desire to expand its influence into the Indian Ocean, a new set of airstrips is being built into the northern and southern islands of Andaman and Nicobar. Indian defense officials say that these airfields will serve two purposes. The first is to extend their ability to conduct long-range aerial surveillance. In this aspect, India's plan is to gather as much intel as possible to keep China in check and allow for a fast deployment if things begin to escalate. 
One example of this is the procurement and increased use of the Boeing P-8I, which has been flown out of Port Blair to conduct anti-submarine surveillance in the surrounding waters. This not only acts as a deterrent, but if it comes down to it, the P-8I could destroy an enemy vessel if needed. This transitions us into the second reason why runways are being built and extended on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. These new extended airfields are being built for national defense as well. Like the naval presence around the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, having aircraft will greatly strengthen India's strategic capabilities in the surrounding area. India currently has hundreds of Soviet-era fighters that can still be deadly if used properly. These aircraft include the Sukhoi Su-30 and the MiG-21s. However, it's the much more modern Hal Tejas designed and constructed by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited that could pose a real threat to Chinese forces operating in the region. Having the ability to mount a naval and aerial defense will be vital to the future if India needs to protect the entrance to the Andaman Sea, Bay of Bengal, or waters of the Indian Ocean. Most of the naval vessels currently stationed at the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are patrol boats and frontline warships. India is not trying to create a conflict, but it knows that the nation needs to be ready if China does become more aggressive. The more intel they have on what's going on in the waters they control, the better their forces will be able to react to hostilities. And although there are no current plans to build submarine bases on the islands, this might change in the future. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has implemented aggressive plans to update and improve India's infrastructure while earmarking around $750 million to also improve the capabilities of the Andaman and Nicobar Command, the only tri-service theater command in the Indian Armed Forces. What all this means is that India is taking the Chinese threat very seriously. They are actively dedicating money and resources to plans to disrupt Chinese expansion into the Indian Ocean. The stronger Indian forces become on and around the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, the more difficult it'll be for China to gain control of the waters of South Asia. China wants to become the sole dominant power in the region, and right now India is one of the main obstacles standing in their way. But things aren't going perfectly for India either. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands may be one of the most important island chains in the region, but maintaining infrastructure there can be incredibly difficult for a variety of reasons. One challenge the Indian government has faced has come from environmentalists who want to protect the islands from development. For several years, the military wanted to construct a radar station on Narkondam Island. It's here that the endangered species of bird called the Narkondam Island Hornbill lives. For years, the environmentalists successfully pleaded their case and ensured the hornbill's habitat was protected. However, when Prime Minister Modi was elected, he dismissed the concerns and ordered the radar station built anyway. A similar scenario unfolded on the Cocoa Islands, where even though environmentalists advocated for the protection of the island's habitat, new radar stations were built anyway to allow India to keep an eye on Chinese military bases in Myanmar. Of the 572 islands in the Andaman and Nicobar chain, only 37 are inhabited. This has led to many of the uninhabited islands being used for narcotic smuggling and unsanctioned stopping points for foreign boats. The hundreds of uninhabited islands could pose a threat to the military assets that India set up in the region and the nation's security. This has become such a major concern for military strategists that they've suggested the government encourage people to relocate to the uninhabited islands to help track vessels and deter illegal activity. And even though the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are extremely important, the Indian government has dragged its feet in terms of infrastructure development. It's reported that an undersea cable link between the mainland and the islands has remained unfinished for years, and that internet connectivity, even at the naval base at Port Blair, is spotty at best. The islands also experience intense weather annually, with cyclones sweeping across the region. These storms have caused damage to roads, bridges, and airfields, many of which are never repaired. Heavy rains for six months out of the year, stall construction projects, and the distance between the islands and the mainland means it's expensive to ship the materials needed to build and repair infrastructure. And the military is certainly not immune to these problems. Even though India is rapidly trying to ramp up the number of ships, aircraft, and soldiers on the islands, there are a lot of barriers standing in the way. China's most likely been keeping a close eye on the situation in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and knowing just how vital the location is, the struggle to militarize the islands has given China hope. It's very likely that China does not want to go to war with India. No matter who won, an all-out war between the two nations would be catastrophic. Therefore, China is happy to continue using gray zone tactics and its economic and naval power to extend its influence in the region. Even though there's still a long way to go for India to properly fortify their position in the region, eventually the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will play a significant role in controlling the shipping lanes and waterways between the South China Sea and the Andaman Sea. 
This is a terrifying thought for China, as they do not want anything restricting the movements of their trade and military vessels. There is little doubt that China will continue to extend its power and influence throughout East and Southeast Asia. India's plans for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands may be the only thing standing in their way. In December 2022, the Japanese government made one of the boldest moves regarding its national defense in over 60 years. According to official Japanese government documents, the country is now seeking offensive weapons to perform a counter-strike capability specifically to retaliate against Chinese ballistic missiles. Around that same time, a Japanese defense expert was asked what the top three security issues were for Japan, and he responded, numbers 1, 2, and 3 were China. But why exactly is Japan preparing for a war against China? War against the regional hegemon is much more likely than you might think. Before diving too deeply into why Japan is preparing for war, one must first understand the significance of what Japan is doing now. After World War II, the United States and the Japanese government agreed Japan could not seek war as a matter of national policy. However, immediate post-war governments interpreted these rules as meaning that though they could not obtain offensive capabilities, they could create a military centered around self-defense. Because of this, the Japanese military does not use standard terminologies like Army, Navy, and Air Force. Instead, ground, maritime, and air self-defense force, respectively. Over the years, Japanese politicians have made it abundantly clear that certain weapon systems are absolutely off the table for use in the Japanese self-defense forces. To no one's surprise, nuclear weapons were banned from ever being in Japanese hands. However, some more conventional weapons are also prohibited. Any intermediate or long-range ballistic missiles, aircraft carriers, and armed drones, among others, have been under a self-imposed ban. Historically, these weapon systems have been seen as exceeding the right to self-defense and thus have been prohibited from Japanese use. With the Bombshell 2022 War Declaration, all these weapon systems and more are now on the table. Japan is seeking this policy change because it firmly believes that a full-scale war with China is a very real possibility, and there are actually a lot of ways it could happen. The first and most obvious way is the disputes around the Senkaku Islands. The Senkaku Islands are a group of around eight uninhabited rocky islands about 100 miles northeast of Taiwan and 250 miles due west of Okinawa. Their name in Japanese means sharp tower, and this is pretty accurate description considering that they are mostly just rocky outcroppings. The only exception to this is Uotsuri Island. Uotsuri Island was once inhabited for several decades, but has been abandoned since World War II. But despite being uninhabited, the Japanese government has always laid claim to these islands and officially owned them in 2012 after purchasing them from their private owners, who were Japanese citizens in Okinawa. Japan is interested in these small, mostly rocky outcroppings because historically they have been rich fishing grounds. However, interest was renewed in the islands after World War II, when a 1968 study found that the nearby areas contained large amounts of oil and natural gas deposits. Almost immediately after this report became public, China and Taiwan made claims against the islands, but whose claims are more legitimate? Essentially, the debate all stems from the aftermath of the disastrous 1894-1895 Sino-Japanese War. In the wake of Japan's overwhelming victory, China made huge land concessions to them, including handing over the island of Taiwan. Because the Senkaku Islands had historically been part of Taiwan, the Japanese government claimed them during the war because they were uninhabited. The treaty did not stipulate whether Japan had possession, but they continued to assume they did. Japan continued to lay claim to the islands even after World War II. Until 1972, the United States had possession of the entirety of the Okinawa Prefecture, and that year the U.S. gave custody of the land back to the Japanese government. Again, the Senkaku Islands were not mentioned explicitly, but the Japanese have inferred it. The Chinese and Taiwanese claims to the island stem from the fact that because Chinese sailors first discovered them in the 14th century, they were a part of Taiwan. Because China views Taiwan as its territory, it's claimed the islands under those auspices. Though the three countries have been arguing over possession of the islands, it's generally agreed worldwide Japan owns them and administers them as part of the Okinawa Prefecture. Taiwan has never made any military moves against the island chain, but beginning around 2010, China started to assert its dominance there as part of its larger strategy of bullying other Asian countries. Chinese interference in the island chain was at first small, but has rapidly increased throughout the years. According to international law, air and sea space within 12 nautical miles of the country's territory is considered sovereign territory. Ships and aircraft that enter these airspaces without permission are violating international law. But of course, China doesn't care about international law and has been steadily increasing its so-called gray zone efforts in the Senkakus. 
Starting in 2010, the Chinese Coast Guard and Maritime Militia Forces entered territorial waters a few dozen times a year. Chinese Air Force planes violated Japanese airspace about as many times. Fast forward 10 years later, maritime violations have now increased to several dozen a month between Chinese fishing, militia, and Coast Guard vessels. Additionally, on average, the Chinese violate Japanese airspace almost 600 times a year. Because of this practically daily occurrence, the Senkaku Islands are a perfect hotbed for a full-scale conflict to break out. But how? The short answer to how Japan could get involved in a full-scale war with China over these rocky islets is because of the 1960 defense treaty it signed with the U.S. After the end of the U.S. occupation in 1952, the Japanese and Americans signed a very one-sided agreement. The agreement did not guarantee Japanese sovereignty and stipulated that the Americans could use bases in Japan for prosecuting wars in Asia without the consent of the Japanese. Massive protests continued throughout the 1960s over this unfair treaty until the two sides inked a new one that's still in effect today. This new treaty guaranteed Japan's sovereignty in the event it was attacked and it obligated the U.S. to respond with force if such an event happened. The treaty also gave the U.S. the legal authority to host troops and bases there in perpetuity, which will be an important fact later on. But if you think the U.S. would just never get involved in a conflict over such meaningless territory, you'd be mistaken. Just last year, President Biden met with his Japanese counterpart and released a joint statement. The statement explicitly stated that Article 5 of the Defense Agreement, the one about protecting Japan against attack, is also legally valid for the Senkaku Islands. Because of this, Biden has made it abundantly clear the U.S. will fight China over these islands if it attacks Japan, and unfortunately, that is a genuine possibility. Whenever China harasses other countries' maritime and land claims, the Chinese always intentionally antagonize the other side. This is the same for Japan. Often, fleets of maritime militia units masquerading as fishermen swarm contested waters. Once there, they'll fish in clear violation of international law. After local police or Coast Guard forces come to arrest them, they'll sometimes attack them, but most of the time, they'll have the Chinese Coast Guard or even the Navy assist them. These tense scenarios can very easily get out of control. One wrong move by either side could see someone hurt or killed, which could be the catalyst for China to overreact and start a military campaign. The next major way Japan could get sucked into a war with China is over Taiwan. Japan has been and will continue to monitor developments regarding China and Taiwan. As one Japanese official said, Taiwan's safety is Japan's safety. But why is that? The most obvious reason to outsiders would be the domino effect. If China is allowed to take Taiwan by force, what about the Senkaku Islands? What about Okinawa? Or other Japanese islands? What would Chinese forces be emboldened to do next? These are questions the Japanese ask themselves almost daily. They have an extreme fear that China will not stop with Taiwan and would continue to conquer territory throughout Asia. However, Japan's major problem in fighting a war with China over Taiwan is its legal justification for doing it. The Japanese Constitution and 1960 Defense Treaty make it abundantly clear Japan can only use its military to defend Japan, but this does leave some wiggle room for interpretation. For example, there are about 20,000 Japanese citizens living in Taiwan. An unprovoked full-scale invasion of Taiwan would certainly cause massive civilian casualties, and it's highly likely large numbers of Japanese citizens would be among them. Though this exact question has not been answered publicly as to whether or not it would constitute an attack on Japan, it is highly likely with current public opinion in Japan against China. There would be support for military intervention. But even if Japan does not at first want to get involved militarily, there is a real chance it could get sucked in because of its defense pact. According to war games done in the U.S., if China tried to invade Taiwan and faced a united American, Japanese, and Taiwanese coalition, the coalition would win every time, albeit suffering heavy casualties. Whenever the war gamers removed Japan as a player, it became a toss-up as to whether Taiwan and America alone would defeat China. When they removed the possibility of not having basing access in Japan, the U.S. and Taiwan lost every time. These war games underscore just how important Japan would be in a potential China-Taiwan conflict. Even if they do not outright participate in the fighting, the dozens of U.S. bases and around 50,000 U.S. service members pre-positioned there would be vital to winning the war. Because of the treaty, the U.S. is guaranteed basing rights in Japan, something we doubt will change anytime soon. Because of this, the U.S. would likely continue using bases in Japan to prosecute the defense of Taiwan. And because of this, Japan could get sucked into a war with China whether the country wanted to or not. Likely, China would not honor Japanese sovereignty and view American bases in Japan as lawful targets, and as such, they would probably launch a massive series of missiles and cyber attacks against them. 
Since Chinese missiles are now raining down on Japan, the government would then be obligated to get involved in the war. Of course, this theory is predicated on Japan being reluctant to enter a war with China. According to most predictions, if a full-scale war between the US and China popped off over Taiwan, Japan would be an active participant for a few reasons. First, as stated earlier, Japan ties Taiwan's territorial integrity to its own. Because almost 90% of the public view China as a threat, there would probably be massive support for a conventional conflict. Secondly, as war games have shown that Japan's involvement in the war would be absolutely vital to the US, there would likely be some secret concessions. This was true throughout the Cold War when both sides made secret concessions about the defense pacts to avoid making public admissions in violation of Japanese law, such as giving the US permission to have nuclear weapons in the country. As far as anyone knows, the US and Japan could have continued to make secret treaties that guaranteed Japanese support in a US-China war over Taiwan. While these two scenarios are the most likely ways Japan could face down China in a full-scale war, there are two other less likely but equally dangerous scenarios. The first of these involves the dispute between Japan and Russia over what Japan calls the Northern Territories. Looking at a map of Japan, one will see that due north of Japan's northernmost island of Hokkaido, there is a string of islands. These are islands known as the Kuril Islands, and most of them have been part of Russia for centuries except for four. During the 1850s, Russia and Japan signed an agreement that guaranteed Japan's sovereignty over the four southernmost islands closest to Hokkaido. These islands, Habomai, Shikotan, Kunashir, and Itorofu, are pretty rocky, but the two largest, Kunashir and Itorofu, are fairly large islands that each support a population of around 7,000 people. These islands came under Russian control in the dying days of World War II. At the Yalta Conference in February 1945, the Allies promised the Soviet Union they could take the entirety of the Kuril Islands as one of the concessions for declaring war against Japan once Germany had been defeated. As promised, four months after Germany surrendered, over a million Soviet troops poured into Manchuria. The invasion went better than anything the Soviets could have hoped for, inflicting tens of thousands of casualties, capturing hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and advancing hundreds of kilometers in just a few weeks made Stalin and his cronies optimistic. They had hoped that they could retake the southern half of Sakhalin Island, lost in the disastrous 1905 war against Japan, and take over the remaining Kuril Islands not in Soviet hands. However, Stalin was worried he would not have enough time before Japan surrendered since he feared his forces would be bogged down in China. With the rapid collapse of the Japanese resistance in China, he felt emboldened to carry out his land grab before Japan surrendered. Starting with Sakhalin several days after Manchuria's invasion, they quickly overran Japanese defenders. Once Sakhalin was secured, Soviet troops launched an amphibious invasion of the northern Japanese territories a week after the atomic bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These troops continued fighting up until the Japanese surrendered on September 2nd. Even though Stalin had achieved all his immediate land grab aims, he still had his eyes set on bigger prizes. Stalin had planned that once his forces secured the northern territories, they would launch a full-scale invasion of Hokkaido Island within two weeks. Fortunately for the Japanese, not only had Stalin run out of time, but his plan had been met with stern disapproval from Western allies. Even though the northern territories had never been under foreign control, Russia refused to hand them over after Japan's surrender. In fact, because of their continued occupation, Russia and Japan have never signed a formal peace treaty ending the war, though they did sign an agreement in 1956 ending the state of war between the two nations. The islands have been a very bitter point of contention between the two countries to this day. Discussion of the islands comes into play frequently in bilateral talks between the two. Putin even suggested that Russia might hand back the two uninhabited islands if Japan agreed to sign a peace deal ending World War II. But just like anything Putin says, he lied and made no actual guarantees, only saying that Russia would consider it. This was met with great public disapproval in Japan, and the talks collapsed. For Russia's part, they are objectively much less provocative toward Japan, at least publicly. Though Russia has militarized the islands in recent years, fewer personnel are there than when the Soviet Union was in control, but that still has not stopped Russia from provoking Japan and making threatening statements. Besides moving weapon systems to the island that could strike well within the Japanese mainland, Russia regularly holds military drills there to antagonize Japan. Not only that, but the Russians also conduct overflight patrols in coordination with Chinese military aircraft over both the Senkaku and Kuril Islands. Russia has directly threatened Japan in the last year after it invaded Ukraine when it promised retaliatory measures if Japan continued joint drills with the US in the East China Sea. But perhaps the greatest provocation is what Russia did in private. 
Authenticated documents and emails released by an FSB whistleblower, the Russian equivalent of the KGB, after Russia's invasion show that Japan could have been Ukraine. The documents, which were believed to be genuine by numerous ex-FSB officials hiding in exile, paint a very dark picture. The emails detailed that the FSB had actually been tasked with coming up with a plan for a limited-scale war against Japan. Details of the plan are hard to find, but it was supposed to take place in August 2021, probably to coincide with the anniversaries of their August 1945 campaigns. The FSB insider stated that FSB officials asked him to prepare the information space should Putin attack Japan. He pointed out to the unannounced disclosure of highly classified KGB documents about alleged Japanese abuses in World War II. According to the defector, he was surprised Putin had decided to invade Ukraine, since they had been doing all the prep work for an attack in Japan. But even if Russia changes course and does not attack Japan in some way, how would that war involve China? The first and most obvious way would be Chinese-Russian cooperability. Not that unlikely, as the two nations conduct joint military drills frequently. If Russia decided to attack Japan under the auspices of military drills, as it did in Ukraine, Japan could see China as a lawful belligerent. Another way China could get sucked into a Japanese-Russian conflict, though, is a proliferation of dual-use military parts. Due to punishing sanctions from around the world, Russia cannot get any of the Western-made parts it needs for its war machine. Everything from missiles to tank sites and drones all contained parts and pieces once obtained from the West. There's an increasing body of evidence that shows China is, at least indirectly, through third parties and at worst directly supplying aid to Russia in the form of these dual-use parts. These parts could be just simple components or entire systems, such as a computer. The circuitry inside the computer could be sold in retail stores, but it could also be used in constructing a missile. The proliferation of these kinds of parts muddy the water of China's involvement in Ukraine and show just how close the two countries are getting. Due to increasing casualties and equipment losses, Russia will likely continue relying on China for years to come. It's not a stretch of the imagination for Japan to blame China if, let's say, a drone sent by Russia attacks Japan and they find out the components of the drone were of Chinese origin. Perhaps the most dangerous scenario for Japan would be a formal military alliance between Russia and China regarding each other's illegal land claims. Of course, this too is purely speculation, but if later down the line China and Russia begin more direct military partnerships over Ukraine and Taiwan, they could be obligated to assist one another in a war. If that were to happen, Chinese forces might be the main adversary in a northern territory's dispute, considering that 97% of the Russian army is tied up in Ukraine. While Russian Far East forces could provide token support, a deeper alliance between Russia and China could potentially involve the Chinese shouldering the bulk of a Russian-Japan conflict. The last possible scenario that could involve Japan getting into a full-scale war with China, though, is through North Korea. As everybody probably knows, North Korea is a pariah state who does pretty much whatever it wants to ensure the survival of its regime. With the exception of South Korea, Japan has bore the brunt of the North Korean intimidation, a fact that could push it to war with Japan and could get China involved. Since 1984, North Korea has carried out 146 ballistic missile tests. However, since 2011, when Kim Jong-un took over, the country has carried out 111 of those tests as of the making of this video. The accelerated nature of these tests and exponential leaps in North Korean missile and nuclear technology have made Japan frightened of the Hermit Kingdom. Over the years, North Korean missiles regularly fly into Japanese waters and sometimes even have flown over the country. This has created such a concern that the Japanese government has an alert system in place to order civilians to shelter if it deems missiles are going to fall too close. The North Korean missile threat is also why both the US Army and Navy provide a robust ballistic missile defense network for Japan. A war between Japan and North Korea could ignite if one of these missiles were to strike the Japanese home islands, a real possibility due to the frequency of the tests. If that were to happen, Japan would most certainly retaliate in kind against North Korea, which would likely balloon into a full-scale conflict. During the course of the conflict, China would inevitably be involved either way. If North Korea would start losing, the Chinese would come in and save the Kim regime. If the North Koreans were winning, they would get involved to prevent the US from using nuclear weapons and solidify the regime gains on the peninsula. But an attack by North Korea could happen during a Taiwan conflict too. North Korea has repeatedly threatened military action against Japan if it involved itself in a war against China over Taiwan. As stated earlier, Japan is very likely to be involved in such a conflict either way. As a result, North Korea might very well carry out its threats and shoot missiles at Japan. This would, in turn, suck Japan into a conflict with North Korea and eventually China.
The Senkaku Islands, a small collection of uninhabited islands west of Okinawa. They're little more than a collection of rocky outcroppings, and they might be among the most contested and controversial islands in Asia. How did these small islands become a flashpoint between Japan and China, and why are they now being fortified? The Senkakus are part of a larger chain called the Ryukyu Islands, which make up the tail end of Japan and brings the country's borders close to the coast of Taiwan. The Senkaku Islands are the furthest from the large islands of Japan, being under 200 miles from Taiwan, and while they may be small and play little overall role in running of the countries surrounding them, they have a long and complex history, one involving not just two countries, but four. How did it all begin? The islands played a key role long before they were considered officially part of any country as navigational markers. During this period, the Ryukyu Islands were the base of the Ryukyu Kingdom, a tributary state of the Ming Dynasty in China starting in 1429. Chinese delegations would use the Senkakus as key marking points for several hundred years and ruled the area until Japan started making a move. The Satsuma Domain, a region controlled by the Tokugawa Shogunate, successfully invaded the Ryukyu Islands and turned the kingdom into its own vassal state in 1609. This status quo lasted for over 200 years until the Empire of Japan formally annexed the region and the limited independence of the royals of the island was absorbed into the Japanese royal power structure. But the long hand of Europe was about to get involved as well. The Senkaku Islands, a small uninhabited collection of islands around 190 miles southwest of Okinawa, were mostly a location of convenience for the various empires that visited them and were called the Diaoyu Islands by Chinese writers. As more and more European explorers and traders started visiting the area, they took on the name Pinnacle Islands, but as interaction with Japan increased, the traditional name started to find greater use. But the islands weren't of much use to anyone, they had no resources that anyone knew of and were mostly used as useful navigational tools. Even after Japan annexed the area, not much changed, until the region was plunged into war. The annexation happened during the First Sino-Japanese War, and soon the fast industrializing Japan realized that these islands could be put to use. Soon the Senkakus were home to a thriving Bonito fish processing plant. Well, thriving for a short time at least. The islands were remote, and the Empire of Japan was more concerned with getting ready for war than propping up failing fish businesses. When the business closed around 1940, the Senkakus went back to being their usual deserted self. The islands remained owned by the same family for a while, but didn't provide any financial benefit to them, and they were about to get a new landlord because Japan was about to suffer a devastating defeat in the Second World War. And that meant the US was coming to town. The US occupied Japan in the aftermath of the war, and that included a long-term occupation of many islands. Okinawa was under formal occupation for almost 30 years until a treaty returning the islands to Japan was passed. The smaller islands, including the Senkakus, were a part of that treaty and returned to Japanese control in 1972. They are currently administered by the mayor of the island of Ishigaki, a thriving commercial island, but commercial development of the islands is prohibited by the central government of Japan. That's because the biggest dispute over the islands was about to kick off. It wasn't long before Japan's sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands was challenged by the Republic of China. With the islands so close to Taiwan, far closer than the major islands of Japan, the small island country felt it had a claim to them. And the tensions over the brutal Japanese occupation of parts of China during the Second World War were still red hot. Surprisingly, Taiwan's bitter rivals in the People's Republic of China backed their claim. With a caveat, because China backs Taiwan's claim while also claiming that Taiwan and everything that belongs to it is part of China, meaning that the Senkaku Islands would be as well. And this dispute hasn't been settled since. But what are these countries actually fighting over? Based on surveys, not much of anything. The island group is confirmed to consist of five small uninhabited islands, as well as three rocks that don't even qualify as islands. However, both China and Japan have done surveys which claim to reveal many more uninhabited islands and rocks. There have been very few visitors to the islands in recent years due to the political controversies and even fewer documentations of what can be found there. However, the largest island, Yuotsurishima, is said to have a pair of mountains with some vegetation. And while they're uninhabited, they're not fully barren. 
Records of plant life on the islands dates back to 1893, when Imperial China authorized an expedition to collect some herb samples. Since then, several surveys have revealed more than 330 species of plants on the largest island alone. Because of how few human visitors the islands have had in recent decades, the plant life is rarely disturbed, at least by humans. Animal life on the island is limited and heavily favors one specific type, the ones who can get there easily. Reports of large numbers of birds on the islands, especially the long-distance flying albatross, are common. The islands have even been designated as an important bird area by ecological organizations. The other common life forms are less welcome, mosquitoes and flies. However, they are not alone. Human intervention has placed other animals on the islands, with them staying there and making it their home. These include chickens, feral cats, and even goats. The most recent resident, thanks to the work of a Japanese political group that believes the island should be more aggressively used to assert Japan's claim. This resulted in the hungry goats going after the vegetation on the islands like goats do, impacting the ecological system for other native animals, including shrews, rats, and fruit bats. There are also a few small lizards and snakes on the island. It's a busy place, and many ecologically-minded groups hope it'll be left alone by various competitors. Good luck with that. China believes that the islands are rightfully China's due to roots in the region dating back to 1534, but the islands were officially signed away by China in a treaty during the First Sino-Japanese War. However, this is complicated by the Potsdam Declaration. Japan's surrender at the end of the Second World War, which had the country surrender all islands outside of a few select stated in the agreement. China then claims that the later agreement to revert control of the islands like Okinawa does not override their historic claim. Historically, China has a strong claim to the islands. All the earliest references to the islands are Chinese, and China formally protested when the islands were returned to Japan. Japan's response is largely controversial. Japan insists that everything is above board, the islands are part of Japan, and they are not willing to negotiate. In fact, they dispute that the islands were ever specifically mentioned in Chinese texts, because the islands are so generic that it could have easily been another set of rocks. Most analysts don't agree with this conclusion, saying that the Chinese descriptions are highly specific. But Japan's legal claim is the one that carries more weight in the international law today, and few countries are willing to take China's side. But that doesn't mean it'll defuse the conflict. For the most part, China and Japan do not seem willing to go to war over a collection of uninhabited islands, and mostly seem keen to just to distribute propaganda supporting their claims. Japan released a website supporting its claims in 2012, and a Chinese propaganda film supporting China's side was released in 2014. Several court battles have been fought over the islands, and harsh words have been exchanged over the dispute, with Taiwan being quieter than the other two larger countries but asserting its own claim whenever it comes up. But as with any Cold War, it stands the risk of getting hot. What does it take to start a war? Actually, very little. A loose word from a diplomat or a foolish action by a fisherman can easily turn into an international incident, and it's happened more than once when it comes to the Senkaku Islands. The islands were calm for around 20 years after they were handed to Japan from the United States, but things have been escalating fast since then. The first incidents involved private citizens such as a Hong Kong activist who attempted to swim to one of the islands and drowned in the attempt, becoming a martyr to those in China who believed they should be reclaimed by any means necessary. And he wouldn't be the only radical to try something like this. In both countries, there are hardline groups who believe that the country should be more assertive in the region. In the case of the Japanese radicals, they tend to come to the island and set up infrastructure or introduce wildlife. Some have built lighthouses there, and this is usually considered a hassle by the Japanese government, both because of the issues with disturbing the island's ecosystem and because when the islands are in the news, conflict with its neighbors is likely to follow. But this is a domestic affair. But the same can't be said for the other incursions. Japan claims the water around the islands as its exclusive economic zone, which is mostly relevant when it comes to fishing, and the waters are considered rich with high-value fish. This was confirmed in a 1997 fishing agreement that determined the boundaries, but Japan has the policy of not interfering with Chinese fishing boats in the region. Japan and Taiwan sorted out their own fishing rights in the region in a 2014 deal, but there's one big wrinkle in the region, and that wrinkle is spelled O-I-L. Is there oil hiding under the Senkaku Islands territorial waters? No one is sure, but everyone wants to find out.
The United Nations Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East first identified potential oil and natural gas reserves in the area in 1969, before the islands reverted to Japanese control. Since then, Chinese interest in the islands has massively increased, but no confirmed energy resources have been found yet. However, the odds are that investigation of these potential resources would be far more intense if there wasn't a territorial dispute with three countries in the region. And things have been ramping up a lot in recent years. Chinese and Taiwanese protesters have become increasingly bold in the 2000s, with activists frequently trying to land on the island. These are usually intercepted by Coast Guard vessels from Japan who turn them back. However, the proximity of Taiwan to the islands means that sometimes Taiwanese and Japanese Coast Guards can intersect or even collide. The protesters have often taken to jumping off their boats and trying to swim to shore when stopped and are usually caught and deported. As a policy, Japan doesn't usually escalate too much when dealing with protesters or collisions between fishing vessels, instead briefly detaining the people involved and releasing them. Japan has even apologized and paid compensation when they were found to be at fault in collisions with civilian fishing vessels. But these were small-scale events. The year was 2010 when the biggest flashpoint in the conflict occurred. A large Chinese fishing vessel trawler entered the disputed waters and was ordered to stop for inspection. Instead, the ship refused the orders and attempted to flee, crashing into several Japanese Coast Guard vessels. The Japanese forces boarded the ship, arrested the captain and 14 people on board for illegal fishing and obstruction, and took them back to Japan for detention. According to Japan, it was a clear-cut case of a rogue ship in its territory. But China disagreed and made itself known. China condemned the arrest, claiming the fishing vessel was illegally intercepted, and summoned the Japanese ambassador for a series of increasingly intense talks. While the boat and the 14 crew members were released after less than a week, the captain was held for over two weeks before being released. This wasn't enough for China, as they demanded an apology and compensation. This following a series of escalations by China including threats in front of the United Nations and the detention of several Japanese businessmen was successful. In China, it was seen as a victory to force Japan to release everyone involved, while the government in Japan was heavily criticized for giving in so quickly. And it would be the first of many escalations. Since then, Japan has increased patrols in the region, with more Japanese fishing vessels entering to fish and assert Japanese sovereignty over the region. A conservative political group, Ganbare Nippon, has engaged several high-profile protests in the area and tried to approach the islands to plant Japanese flags. But these have all been civilian disruptions, and Japan has largely stopped most of the protesters. After all, there's no reason to start another diplomatic incident if you don't have to. But in recent years, China might be giving them no choice. The reason things are escalating now is because the conflict has shifted from private incursions and diplomacy to direct Chinese military provocations. Starting in 2012, Chinese and Taiwanese government and military flights started entering the airspace over the Senkaku Islands. Japan's air force scrambled and the country issued a protest, but it didn't deter the Chinese. But surprisingly, the most direct conflict didn't come with Chinese vessels, it came against Taiwanese ships. It was a tense standoff and also a little silly. It was September 2012 when 75 Taiwanese fishing vessels and 10 Coast Guard boats approached the island and were met by Japanese Coast Guard ships. Threats were issued and neither side backed off, so the two groups fired, with water cannons to try to drive off the other side. A combination of LED lights and loudspeakers were used to broadcast claims of dominance and territorial rights. In what most analysts said was a loud, flashy standoff that neither side actually wanted to descend into a shooting war. But China also joined in on the fun. The escalation of Chinese military intervention in the region was worrisome for many nations, especially once they saw China sending armed planes and vessels into the region to lock in on Japanese vessels. China claimed it was a routine training exercise, but the US disputed that, revealing that China had been moving ballistic missiles into the region. Japan threatened to shoot down Chinese drones, China responded and said this would be an act of war, and the tensions escalated for a while. Starting in 2014, the issue seemed to fade off the front page as Chinese activity in the region declined declined and the status quo carried on. But nothing good lasts forever. In 2020, when everyone had other things on their mind, Chinese government vessels started entering the disputed areas much more frequently. In fact, Japan reported that there had been a streak of at least 67 days in a row with incursions, and as of 2022, there was a new reason for concern. China wasn't alone anymore. 
as China and Russia grew closer after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent isolation by much of the world, the two great powers increased military cooperation, and Japan was shocked when a Russian frigate entered its territorial waters on June 4. Not only were the Chinese and Russian vessels back, but they were acting with increasing confidence, with some staying for several days in a row as if to dare Japan to do something about it. And it's no surprise Japan has responded. Japanese diplomatic protests to China fell on deaf ears, as the provocation was likely the point of their actions. So Japan has sought out help from its allies, something that became all the more essential when China included the islands in a new air defense identification zone. This was ostensibly a way to guard against potential air threats, but functioned as a way to intimidate not just Japan, but the United States, which had been flying more Air Force jets through the area with Japan's permission. A high-stakes game of brinksmanship began, as China began ordering Japanese and American planes to identify themselves as they flew through what was internationally recognized as Japanese territory. They refused, and China wisely refrained from attempting to enforce its zone with military force. But the standoff continued. And escalation has continued. While both Taiwan and China claim the islands, the two have differed wildly in how far they're willing to go. With only 41% of Taiwan residents willing to fight a war over the Senkaku Islands, 91% of mainland Chinese respondents say they are, and China has played to that sense of patriotism. In 2021, passing a law authorizing the Coast Guard to use lethal force in conflicts over territorial waters. In response, Japan has been increasing its own presence, constructing radar stations in the area, and launching larger and more advanced patrol vessels to fend off incursions. This is all a game of inches in Asia, but there are some recent indications that things have changed. The Senkaku Islands aren't alone anymore in being encroached on by China. In the last few years, China has become more aggressive about asserting claims in disputed areas or other countries' territorial waters, primarily in the South China Sea. This has led to other countries, including Vietnam and the Philippines, forging closer ties with the US to fend off China. All the while, China not just lays claim to these waters, but transforms small reefs into built-up artificial islands equipped with missile defenses that aim to turn them into Chinese property by implied threat alone. And Japan no doubt fears the same fate for the Senkaku Islands, something Taiwan wouldn't be happy about either. After all, Taiwan is China's ultimate reach goal in the region, and the mainland threatens war with the small island nation regularly. So now it might be time to fight fire with fire. Japan has one key tool in its arsenal against China, the US-Japan Security Treaty, which is designed to protect Japan from a Chinese invasion as part of Japan's agreement to give up its own military capacity in the aftermath of World War II. While Japan has been building up its own military in recent years, it still relies heavily on US protection. But whether this protection applies to the Senkaku Islands will likely depend heavily on just how far Japan is willing to go to hold on to these rocky outcroppings. And the answer seems to be pretty far. The Senkaku Islands are pretty bare of infrastructure, but that is slowly changing. And in March 2023, Japan took its biggest step yet, completing a new military base in the area and moving in some powerful forces. This isn't on the Senkaku Islands. Those are so small that a military base there would make no sense. Rather, the base is located on nearby Ishigaki, around 200 kilometers away from the Senkaku Islands. Ishigaki is a very different place from the Senkakus, currently a thriving vacation spot popular with scuba divers. And now, it's popular with soldiers as well. Around 570 ground self-defense force members from Japan's most elite fighting forces have moved into the new base camp. And while Japan hasn't exactly said what they're there to do, it's clear to all observers. They're there to spring into action if China makes a move on the Senkaku Islands. And it seems likely that Japan means business, because these aren't just soldiers, they include missile squads who will be among the first line of defenses in a war, launching a barrage of surface-to-air missiles. And this is part of a much larger trend. The Okinawa region of Japan has been a massive hub of military growth in recent years, with Japan opening up four bases since 2016 alone, all on islands in the region. While previous bases have had smaller contingents of troops, most of the bases also include missile deployments, making it very clear that while Japan isn't looking to start a conflict, they are ready to fight one if it comes to it. Japan's military leadership was interviewed and made clear that it was ready to defend its territory if need be which is a big change for a country that has been cursed by its history. 
No country has been transformed more by losing a war than Japan, going from a military powerhouse ruled by an emperor to a pacifist democracy that has lacked a full standing army until recent years. But that agreement, which allowed Japan to only have a self-defense force, was largely administered by the US and its allies, and all of them shared the same concern about China's growing aggressive presence in the South China Sea and beyond. So, as Japan begins to fortify for a potential war, the US is willing to look the other way and even aid Japan as it embarks on its biggest military increase in decades. But is there an end game here? Is Japan's new military force capable of fending off a Chinese invasion of the Senkaku Islands? If China prepares for an attack, probably not. China has the second most powerful army in the world at the moment and is building up to compete with the US. By comparison, Japan is only beginning a buildup. So if a conflict was to break out, Japan is likely banking heavily on US assistance, which would likely be coming barring a major change in US leadership that would take the country in an isolationist direction. But just because you can't win a conflict doesn't mean you can't prevent it. The Senkaku Islands are valuable to Japan both strategically and from a political perspective. Taking them brings China closer to Taiwan from another angle, making it easier to cut the small island nation off from supplies brought by allies. This may be the primary reason why China wants the islands, but it would also be a massive PR victory in the region. Japan is the most powerful country besides China in East Asia, and showing that China could intimidate Japan into giving up the islands or not retaliating when they're captured could go a long way to convincing other players in the region that China cannot be opposed. Which is why a show of force early is key. It might sound like a playground rule, but finders keepers actually does play a key role in international relations. If a territory is actively contested, it's common for support to rush to the invaded party and prolong the conflict inevitably. That's what happened in Ukraine. When the Eastern European country fended off an early attempt to encircle Kyiv and take control of the country, and Western money and weapons flooded in, allowing Ukraine to hold Russia at bay for over a year. However, in the eastern Ukrainian areas Russia did take, Putin quickly annexed them, held sham referendums, and declared that attempting to take them back would be the equivalent of invading Russia. And a similar thing could play out in Japan. The Senkaku Islands have no defenses on site, because the islands are too small for a full-time military presence to be posted on them. However, defending them from the main Japanese islands wouldn't work either, because a full-fledged Chinese invasion could potentially take the islands before Japan could respond and then declare that any resistance would be attacking Chinese islands. On the other hand, Japan's current approach, fortifying some of the larger islands near the Senkaku Islands, allows Japan to arrive on site much faster, potentially engaging the Chinese military before they can claim the islands, and making the People's Republic of China decide if they're truly ready for an all-out war over some rocks in the sea. Which means that these disputed rocks may continue to be occupying everyone's mind in the region for a long time. India and China are on the verge of war, and any day now the shooting could start. Just a few short decades ago, the idea of the two most populous nations going to war seemed preposterous. China and India were both leaders of the non-aligned movement, naturally after China broke up with the Soviet Union in a messy divorce. Both nations saw the power struggle taking place between the Soviet Union and the United States and wished to remain free of influence from both superpowers, and to keep other smaller nations around them similarly free of that influence. Things didn't quite go to plan, and China found out there were significant benefits to being BFFs with the big kid on the block. However, India and China's relationship began to sour long before this, mostly over territorial disputes, chief amongst them being the fate of Tibet. India viewed Tibet as a natural buffer between itself and China, and China, with an eye to the future, wished to annex Tibet so as to control the all-important headwaters of various rivers critical to China's well-being. The ensuing annexation also placed China on the military high ground, so to speak, a significant advantage it enjoys to this day. Disputes over where the actual territorial boundary of each nation lay added fuel to the fire, but it was India giving political asylum to the Dalai Lama which effectively destroyed Indian and Chinese relations. This would result in a border war between the two powers in 1962, which saw the Chinese secure advantageous positions along the northern disputed border but was limited in scope and fighting. When Pakistan went to war with India in 1965, China backed Pakistan and threatened to push the issue of its territorial conflicts with India. In 1967, India got its revenge, with two different border clashes that favored India this time. 
China turned to financing political extremists inside of India, especially dissident groups in northeastern India. In 1971, India and Pakistan took up their favorite pastime and once more declared war on each other, with China once more backing Pakistan and even threatening to join the conflict on Pakistan's side. However, by the end of the decade, both sides tried to kiss and make up, with both nations turning a blind eye to possible human rights abuses carried out by the other in their own territory. The Indian Prime Minister and the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs exchanged visits to each other's capitals, a landmark move that signaled closer ties ahead for the two most populated nations on Earth. However, the friendship was not meant to be. As both sides once more began to reinforce their shared border and make strategic moves to gain local advantages over the other. In 1987, most people believed war was inevitable, but after a series of border clashes, ultimately both sides backed away from what would turn into a highly destructive war. Going into the 1990s, China and India once more attempted to reset relations, setting up a task force to troubleshoot border disputes and engaging in mutual rounds of military de-escalation along the border. Consulates for each other's nations reopened in 1992, and both sides signed cooperation agreements on issues ranging from trade to global warming and combating animal extinctions. Then in 1998, India undertook a series of nuclear tests, which China strongly condemned. Indian Defense Minister George Fernandez made it clear that India's nuclear arsenal was primarily to defend from China, stating that China was enemy number one for India. Relations between the two sides quickly soured, with China once more supporting Pakistan in the 1999 Kargil War. Relations would remain rocky between the two throughout the 2000s and 2010s, though steadily worsening and topping off with a border clash in 2020 that led to 11 soldiers being injured. A month later, another clash would leave 20 Indian troops dead and an unknown number of Chinese troops killed. Both sides had agreed not to carry firearms to lower the risk of accidental conflict, so the ensuing border clashes and more to come afterwards were undertaken with everything from homemade clubs and spears to riot batons. India would go on to ban 59 Chinese apps, citing espionage concerns, and crack down on Chinese spying inside the country. Then, in October of 2020, India made the unprecedented move of signing a cooperation agreement with the United States. Not a treaty, this simple agreement lays out the foundation of what would eventually turn into a full-blown mutual defense treaty, and it puts India on the path of becoming one of the US's many global allies. To say that China was upset about this would be to put it mildly. What would come next, though, would result in a litany of diplomatic protests. India would look to secure its one geographic advantage over China by building up military installations on islands in the Indian Ocean, with a major base being developed on the Mauritian Islands. This will allow India to effectively choke off Chinese shipping through the Indian Ocean, through which travels most of China's oil imports and a great deal of its international exports. From multiple points in the Indian Ocean, the Indian Navy and Air Force are looking to shut down Chinese trade in the case of a war and limit the ability of the Chinese Navy to operate in the Indian Ocean. But China is fighting back, building up its own military installation on an island off the coast of Myanmar. Satellite imagery recently revealed a 2,300-meter runway as well as multiple housing and maintenance facilities. It's believed that ultimately it'll serve as a signals intelligence base for the Chinese military, though the lengthy runway means it'll be able to operate heavy aircraft from it as well, threatening the Indian Navy from the skies. India is going to need every advantage it can get against China because it's lagging significantly behind in just about every metric. The Indian the military is suffering from a modernity crisis with many of its weapon systems aging out and no replacements in the pipeline. For decades, India has attempted to stay neutral between the Soviet Union and then Russia and the United States in the West. This gave the country access to both sides' military exports, but by not choosing sides, neither was willing to let India get its top-shelf stuff. That is, until Russia needed India's money to build a fifth-generation fighter, only for India to ultimately pull out of the Su-57 project when it realized it would be unable to do anything it was advertised to do, and not be a competitor to the US F-22 or F-35. This neutrality might have served it politically, though that's arguable, but it has left India to basically shop for military hardware in the bargain bin. Attempts to kickstart a domestic arms industry have so far not gone to plan, with the development of the Arjun tank taking decades and delivering a product Indian tankers themselves consider substandard. Without strong defense partnerships, India is now attempting to build a fifth-generation fighter to eventually be upgraded to a sixth-gen, but the entire program is still on the drawing board and unlikely to get very far. India has many talented engineers, but the nation simply lacks the experience of a mature aerospace industry like many military heavyweights in the West have. 
This is the reason why India has been looking to get chummy with the US lately, with the nation joining the now famous Quad. This informal organization made up of the United States, Japan, India, and Australia is focused on South Pacific security, mostly geared toward containing China. For India, the US offers a mature, robust military-industrial complex and the opportunity to equip itself adequately against a currently far superior Chinese force. For the US, India is a natural partner as a fellow democracy and is strategically poised to deliver a death blow to the Chinese trade in case of war, a natural deterrent to said war. The Chinese military is pound for pound far better equipped than the Indian military. A steady upgrade program has resulted in an air force that's over half modern, while the Indian Air Force is struggling to keep aging airframes combat ready. To add to India's problem, China is the third nation in the world to field a fifth-generation fighter, though the J-20 is largely considered a low observable and not a true stealth platform. With 200 in service and more being added every year, however, India's air force would struggle significantly against the far superior Chinese forces. China's defense industry is also more developed than India, even if it's better at stealing and copying technology than actually developing and innovating on its own. Given that a significant part of the developed world sees China as a potential threat to the global order, nations have increasingly been reluctant to give China access to their advanced manufacturing techniques, also because they inevitably will try to steal them. This leaves China wholly reliant on Western, Japanese, and South Korean manufacturing equipment for high-precision tooling, and these countries are increasingly tamping down on the access China has to their machines. Despite this, China's defense industry is far more mature than India's and poses a significant threat in the coming decades as it gains more and more experience. This is why closer partnerships with the US and the West on the whole are so important to India, and part of its strategy to checkmate China. India and the US are steadily improving their partnership with both sides holding multiple joint exercises. In 2022, Indian and American Special Forces undertook a series of exercises in Hawaii, and the India-US Defense Acceleration Ecosystem, or Indus-X, aims to tie the two nations even closer together through joint development of key technologies. Part of Indus-X is the United States assisting India with technical expertise and money in the building of new logistical hubs as well as repair and maintenance infrastructure for the Indian Air Force and the Navy. The United States has rapidly become one of India's major military suppliers, as well as its largest military exercise partner, with multiple joint training exercises undertaken by both sides. India is getting the advantage of learning how to fight like the US, while for the US, a strong India means a stable and peaceful South Pacific. There is significant work toward allowing India access to top-shelf American military technology as well. While no high-profile transfers are in the works just yet, the two sides are agreeing to cooperate on a number of technologies. India has a huge number of highly skilled engineers and computer scientists, which the US companies could put to great use. In exchange, these same professionals would gain invaluable experience they could take back home with them to jumpstart joint US-Indian efforts. Two further foundational defense agreements have been signed between the two nations, with a focus on joint force interoperability and intelligence sharing. The agreement set the stage for both sides learning how to operate alongside each other's forces, much in the same way that NATO forces operate jointly. Intelligence sharing will greatly increase both sides' ability to counter Chinese influence in the region, especially in its efforts to destabilize India politically or carry out acts of industrial sabotage or theft. However, the future is not all roses for an American-Indian relationship. The US has recently developed significant concerns over a growing trend of undemocratic activities by Indian politicians and has equal concerns about India's ability to maintain the type of defense spending that a joint partnership would require. India's enduring ties with Russia, despite the latter's illegal invasion of Ukraine and continued campaign of war crimes, further strained US-Indian relations, and concerns that India might be the wrong partner for America have recently begun to surface on the other side of the Pacific. Lately, India has also proven to be slow to respond to Chinese provocations on its own border, which concerns American military planners who fear a radical shift in India toward the appeasement of China, putting at jeopardy joint defense ventures between the two sides. The US would like to see India address its increasing authoritarianism and move back toward more liberal values. 
There were also significant concerns over India's either inability or unwillingness to tackle a massive scam industry within its own borders, with Indian scammers stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from the US and other Western nations each year. On many occasions, these scammers have completely avoided prosecution or simply had a blind eye turned to them by corrupt police, despite Western law enforcement bringing evidence of their activities to Indian authorities. Scammers remain a significant strain on the honor of the Indian people and a major roadblock to further deepening ties between India and any potential Western partners. With India staging its forces closer to strategically important waterways like the Straits of Malacca, the nation is set to gain the ultimate upper hand over China. However, with Chinese military capabilities growing at an exponential rate relative to itself, India needs partnerships with other global powers more than ever. How it chooses to pursue those partnerships and how committed to them it remains will dictate the future of India and its people. By joining a loose alliance designed to chip away at Western superiority, did India set itself up for an inevitable fall? That alliance is known as BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and it's essentially an informal club, think NATO without the official status dedicated to expanding the political and economic interests of its members. For years, India has benefited from being a part of BRICS, but with the organization's recent expansion, India might be seeing its commitment of non-alignment get challenged, potentially leading to conflict with Western nations, or perhaps even worse, its fellow BRICS members. This isn't what India expected when it joined the alliance. And with the challenges occurring in BRICS as we speak, now might be the time to walk away from the group before India becomes so firmly entrenched within the alliance that it's forced to commit to decisions it otherwise would not make. To explain why, we need to start by answering a simple question, what is BRICS? You already know the basics. BRICS is a loose alliance of five countries, though that has changed in recent months, which was officially founded in 2009 to provide a platform for its members. That platform, primarily focused on Asia, is intended to challenge the political power wielded by the United States and other Western powers, essentially giving countries that previously had less of a voice on the global stage more negotiating power. Interestingly, even though the BRICS acronym became official in 2009, it had actually been used much earlier. In 2001, economist Jim O'Neill coined the term in an article for Goldman Sachs titled Building Better Global Economic BRICS. In that article, he pointed to what would become the four founding members of BRICS as some of the fastest growing economies in the world even going so far as to claim they would likely dominate the global economy by 2050, a claim that doesn't appear unrealistic given the state of the world in 2023. Since the inception of BRICS, the heads of state of each of its member countries have met annually to discuss global political and economic policy, with the chairmanships rotating among those members on an annual basis. Collectively, the leaders oversee the fates of about 40% of the world's population, somewhere in the region of 3.2 billion people so its influence cannot be understated. Ostensibly, the group is supposed to enhance economic cooperation between its members, particularly in the areas of trade and infrastructural development, all in the hopes of creating a foundation on which the BRICS members can stand when negotiating on a global scale. So far, so beneficial to India. The existence of BRICS, at least in its theoretical form, is supposed to deliver substantial economic benefits to India. The country's infrastructure should improve and its economy should grow stronger as a result of the alliance. And in fairness to BRICS, that has generally been the case since 2009. The World Bank's GDP growth stats for India show, barring a massive blip during 2020 that can't be blamed on BRICS membership, India's economy has generally grown consistently since it joined the alliance. For instance, in 2021, India saw its GDP rise by 9.1%, with 2022 following that with a 7% increase. Again, so far, so good. BRICS appears to be achieving what India hoped it could achieve when it joined the group. But if that's the case, why are many on the world stage saying now is the time for India to leave the loose alliance? The simple answer is that there are factors at play that could lead to BRICS membership becoming less of a blessing and more of a curse in the coming years. And that starts with the recent expansion of the group. In August 2023, BRICS invited six new countries into its club. Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are the heaviest hitters, particularly Saudi Arabia, thanks to its huge cash reserves. And the other three new members, Argentina, Ethiopia, and Egypt, all stand to gain from being a part of the alliance that's supposed to bolster their economies and help transform them into respectable world powers. Marking the group's first expansion since 2010, when it welcomed South Africa into the fold, the new alliance has coined the moniker of BRICS Plus, and it seems to be on track to enhance its goal of switching the current geopolitical power balance in favor of countries that don't have much of a place at the Western-led table. But in this expansion, we start to see the formation of divergent interests in the group, 
that could place India at odds with the rest of its members. Take China and Russia as examples. Both are countries that have long been at odds with Western powers. Some may even argue that Russia, at least, is actively anti-West, with China certainly not too far behind. India has never traditionally shared the anti-West approach. Yes, it wants to grow its economy and strengthen its position on the global political stage, but at the same time, India has always taken an approach of nurturing ties with everyone, essentially trying to stay as neutral as possible. That might soon become impossible if India chooses to keep operating within a group that's displaying increasingly anti-West sentiments. Now cast your mind back to the proposed new members of BRICS. Iran should stand out immediately. Much of the 2010s was marred by diplomatic conflict between the United States and Iran. The states issued nine executive orders designed to neuter Iran in some way between 2010 and 2013 alone, with several of those orders imposing sanctions while condemning Iran for its human rights abuses. So Iran clearly has an axe to grind with the US, an axe that's actually been grinding since the seizure of the US Embassy in Tehran in 1979. America's relationship with Saudi Arabia is just a little more complicated. The countries share deep diplomatic ties based predominantly around oil, with the US being a somewhat overt ally to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for nearly 80 years. But there is no denying the Saudis have their own agenda, and it's possible that its inclusion into the new BRICS could lead to mounting instability in a relationship that's been rock solid for decades. What about Argentina? It went to war with the United Kingdom in the 1980s over the Falklands, and there still exists some resentment and tension about a Western country's claim on an island that Argentina believes should be theirs. The point is simple, BRICS's new members have either an anti-West stance or at least engage in policies that cause concern for the current dominating force of the geopolitical landscape. While that's the point, BRICS exists to upset the current global status quo, it's a point that's getting ever sharper, which is something that India might not feel comfortable with as BRICS expands its power base, and that's becoming an increasingly urgent problem. If we allow a moment for speculation, what might happen if a BRICS member, say Iran or China, enters into direct conflict with a Western power. Would India be expected to support its fellow BRICS members financially? Would it feel obligated to provide military aid in order to maintain its relationships within BRICS? These are questions we don't have the answers to, but they are questions that could make many in India feel uncomfortable. After all, the country enjoys a good relationship with many Western powers, yet the inclusion of these six new members, combined with China's growing political power and Russia's attempts to expand its territory in Europe, could place India in a difficult position. Perhaps we're seeing a soft power play at work here, in which BRICS continues to speak openly about building trade and creating a bigger seat at the global table for marginalized states while its members use the alliance to further their own political agendas. If that's the case, due to its neutrality, India could be a mere pawn in BRICS's game to upend the Western world order. An anti-West stance could be forced upon it perhaps even more dangerously for India, it might find itself at odds with its fellow BRICS members, potentially seeking support outside the alliance to maintain its global position. For its part, India has subtly tried to get ahead of these potential issues. In a June 2023 meeting of BRICS members, the country's foreign minister, Subramaniam Jashankar, made sure to keep his focus on economic power, remarking that the current balance leaves too many nations at the mercy of too few. That is essentially a restatement of BRICS's original goal, to revise the global power balance so that its members have more of a voice. But the simple fact that Jashankar made that statement suggests that India is getting a touch uncomfortable with increasingly contrasting agendas of the club's members. That brings us to the most obvious example of these differing agendas, the war in Ukraine, where India appears to be trying to use BRICS meetings to reaffirm the organization's original agenda, Putin is using those very same summits to justify his actions in Ukraine. That was made clear during the August 2023 BRICS summit where Putin appeared via video link to claim that the invasion was not an invasion at all, but a response to the supposedly increasingly hostile actions of Washington and Kyiv against Moscow. Our actions in Ukraine are dictated by only one thing, to end the war that was unleashed by the West and its satellites against the people who live in the Donbass, Putin said. But perhaps more indicative of his approach was his follow-up statement, I want to note that it was the desire to maintain their hegemony in the world the desire of some countries to maintain this hegemony that led to the severe crisis in Ukraine. Here we see a twisting of the BRICS agenda. Putin mentions maintaining a hegemony, referencing the West's continued hold over the global geopolitical landscape, and in doing so, he tries to position his war not as an act of aggression by Moscow, but as an action taken in the spirit of BRICS, with the goal of disrupting the current global power balance. India wants to do that by following the original BRICS agenda, 
economic strengthening of the countries within the club, but Putin seems happy to twist that agenda to fit his own ends. It's also telling that Putin didn't show up in South Africa, the host country of the 2023 summit. Given South Africa's membership in the International Criminal Court, or the ICC, he could have been arrested for war crimes if he showed up in person. So Putin showed up via video to push his agenda. This has put India between a rock and a hard place. It's emblematic of the anti-West sentiment that's growing within BRICS, where some members of the group are no longer proposing themselves as an alternative, but as active combatants in a war against Western interests. So we start to see the uncomfortable position in which India finds itself. Is Russia expecting India to support its acts of aggression? Perhaps it does, which may be why India is one of the few US allies that hasn't joined the world in its public condemnation of the invasion. Instead, India has tried to remain neutral, a position that might put it at odds with both Russia and the US if it isn't careful. Abstaining from votes to condemn Russia in the UN Security Council, Human Rights Council, and General Assembly could all be seen as India's tacit acceptance of Putin's tactics. But the lack of direct support it offers could also lead to Russian aggression if Putin is successful in Ukraine and later decides to take stock of who his allies really are. But perhaps India is less focused on picking a side between Russia and the Western powers because it has problems of its own to handle, namely China. If membership to BRICS is supposed to signify strong economic ties between China and India, the recent skirmishes taking place along the India-China border suggests the mutual trust that exists between the two nations is fraying. It all comes down to the line of actual control, or the LAC, a 2100-mile border that separates China and northern India. The LAC is contested. Both China and India want to have control of it, and a skirmish that occurred in the summer of 2020 demonstrated that economic alliances don't result in military peace. Granted, the skirmish was relatively small, at least compared to what you might expect from such a battle. Depending on who you ask, around 40 to 50 people died as a result, with the deaths being split quite evenly between the two sides. Even so, neither side used any firearms, so most of the soldiers involved only sustained a few injuries. This border skirmish led to a round of 17 military talks between China and India that failed to find a satisfactory resolution. Neither country seems willing to back down. Since that skirmish, the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, has carried on building infrastructure while reinforcing its ground-based presence in the contested area. For its part, New Delhi directed 50,000 troops to the LAC in 2021 and has plans to build over 70 strategic roads near the border, as well as maintains an air force presence in the region. This has all happened despite both countries signing disengagement agreements since 2020. We're looking at a powder keg that seems like it's going to explode sooner rather than later. Imagine this scenario. Russia is successful in its invasion of Ukraine and reinforces itself as a military power in Europe. It then turns its attention to other countries, namely those that didn't offer it direct support despite supposedly being aligned with its goal of tackling Western hegemony. India falls into that category thanks to its neutral stance. Perhaps China could take advantage of that by calling on Moscow to help it in the LAC. After all, China has blamed both the West and NATO for provoking Russia into its attack on Ukraine a position that Putin will certainly find pleasing, and it appears to be supporting Moscow even as it claims that it wants to serve as a peacekeeper. If Putin wins and goes on to take stock, he's going to see that one of his BRICS allies supported him where another didn't, and that could spell danger for India should China choose to escalate its military actions along the LAC. And it's not just the LAC that presents a problem to India where China is concerned. China is also increasing its military presence in both the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. For instance, a 2022 article published in The Guardian claimed that China has militarized at least three of the islands in the South China Sea, disputed territory by the way, by installing anti-aircraft and anti-ship missile systems. Radar jammers are also in place, and there's apparently a stock of fighter jets that call this trio of islands home. This is all according to Admiral John C. Acalino, a US Indo-Pacific commander, who points out that China's previously assured other countries that it wouldn't turn these artificial islands into military bases. The country's actions are a little more ambiguous in the Indian Ocean, but no less threatening. Over the past 30 years, China has been building more and stronger relationships with countries that have ports leading into the Indian Ocean. Some of these relationships appear altruistic. China offers support to the countries in question, whereas others seem to show China is trying to leverage debt trap diplomacy by funding infrastructural improvements in different countries that it can later use as a bargaining tool to set up shop should a war break out. There will be more on that tactic when we explore the Belt and Road Initiative. More worrying from an Indian perspective is China's ongoing efforts to create a blue water fleet that's capable of operating in the ocean. According to the US Department of Defense's 2020 annual report, 
China had more than 100 frigates, destroyers, and corvettes that could be used to conduct missions in the Indian Ocean. That was three years ago. How many more of those ships exist in 2023? All of these actions point to China preparing to undertake a more aggressive approach to its already fractured relationship with India in the near future. And if that were to happen, could India's BRICS membership count against it? There's no guarantee that India would receive Western support in such a situation if it refuses to leave BRICS, despite the growing anti-West sentiment that exists in the group. On top of that, if it comes to war, India might not be able to rely on other BRICS members, especially those that are reliant on China for supporting their economic growth. That brings us to China's potentially insidious infrastructure program, the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. The idea behind the BRI is on the surface as beneficial to the Asian economy as BRICS is purported to be. It's an initiative dubbed the New Silk Road by some that was launched by China's President Xi Jinping as a massive infrastructural project that links East Asia, Europe, Africa, and Latin America. China essentially acts as a lender, providing most of the funds developing nations need to build new roads and similar infrastructure, enhancing regional development, and providing China with more nations to export its goods to. And therein lies the problem. China provides most of the funds. Some analysts have classified the BRI as a potential Trojan horse project to aid China in both its regional development and military expansion throughout Asia. China is heavily invested in the project. Some estimates put their investment into the initiative at around $1 trillion so far, and they might spend as much as $8 trillion by the time they're finished. But remember, most of these, quote, investments have been given out as loans. So where does the Trojan horse aspect come into play? A 2021 study conducted by Aid Data, the Center for Global Development, the Kiel Institute, and the Peterson Institute found that China has already created over 100 debt financing contracts to pay for infrastructural developments. Within those contracts lurk some potentially catastrophic clauses. One gives China the right to demand repayment of its loans whenever it wants, creating a dangerous situation for the countries it's financing. After all, these countries don't have the money to build the infrastructure themselves, so they definitely don't have the cash reserves to repay an entire loan if China decides to renege on its agreements by asking for the money up front. While China doesn't appear to have exercised that clause with any countries yet, consider this. China has invested more than $65 billion into the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, or CPEC. And in October 2023, the two countries agreed on another deal in which China will fund the development of a new multi-billion dollar railway in Pakistan, adding another $7 billion to the pot. Pakistan currently owes China somewhere in the region of $72 billion for BRI projects alone. This is a country with a GDP of $377 billion. As such, Pakistan has taken on an enormous amount of debt for which China could come calling at any moment. Given the historical tensions that already exist between Pakistan and India, it is not outside the realm of possibility that Pakistan might allow China to use the very infrastructure China is helping build to launch attacks on India in exchange for lowering some of its payments. It's the debt trap mentioned earlier in action. China's creating debt that it might be able to leverage in the future to gain advantageous positions. But it's a second clause that might be more damaging to India. China restricts its debtors from restructuring their loans with any of the 22 members of the Paris Club. This club is a collection of the most powerful economies on the planet, and it exists for a similar purpose to the BRI. And guess which country just happens to be a member? India. Think about this in the context of BRICS. The organization exists to help its member nations strengthen their economic footholds. Yet, China is inserting clauses into its BRI contracts that actively prevent India from helping smaller countries develop infrastructure, leaving said countries reliant on China alone to grow. Again, we're seeing diverging goals come into play. Where Russia seems intent on twisting the purpose of BRICS to serve its own purposes by using breaking the Western hegemony as a justification for war, China is essentially fulfilling the organization's aim through monetary intervention, but it's doing it in such a way that it excludes other BRICS members, India included, from playing a role in the infrastructural expansion throughout Asia. India is being cleverly leveraged away from agreements that could lead to it creating stronger diplomatic ties by a combination of China's flexing of its financial muscle and its clever funding agreements. So, we come back to the statement made in the video title, India Should Leave BRICS. Why? The addition of the new members to BRICS, Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular, weaken India's position in the organization and put it in a position where it might have to adopt an increasingly anti-Western approach if it maintains its membership. Russia is already pushing for this approach, 
We see that in Putin's efforts to use BRICS's purpose of breaking the Western geopolitical stranglehold as a justification for its invasion of Ukraine. It's also worth pointing out that India is a democracy. While not unique to BRICS, South Africa is a democracy too, it does mean that India's population has more of a say on its BRICS membership than the populations of other countries like Russia and China. And that population coupled with India's leadership might be concerned with the current expansion taking place in the organization. According to an article published by the Atlantic Council, 22 countries have applied for BRICS membership, with six of those having been successful. That's already painful enough for India, which risks losing its voice among the swell of new members. But if more countries join, India's position and its desire to use BRICS for economic expansion rather than militaristic shows of strength could be pushed to the wayside. Still, it's not like India doesn't have options if it does decide to leave BRICS. It could argue that one of the newest members, Iran, is well-placed to replace India's I in BRICS. Granted, that's a somewhat flimsy argument, but India could use it as justification for leaving, perhaps arguing that it's achieved everything it would like to achieve within the alliance and it's now ready to let other nations benefit. Self-removal from BRICS would also allow India to focus on building stronger ties with nations in other emerging alliances. Take the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad, as an example. India is already a member of this loose strategic alliance, which also includes Australia, Japan, and the United States. Observers already believe that India's membership into this group has helped it to counter China's ever-expanding economic and military ambitions. So perhaps leaving BRICS and deepening strategic ties through Quad would give India the backing it needs to ward off the many subtle threats China's been throwing in the country's direction. Another group which India could potentially exert more influence in is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Currently, that group includes several minor Asian countries, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Laos, Brunei, and Indonesia. Like BRICS, ASEAN has the goal of strengthening the economies of its member nations. Imagine what the addition of India could achieve for that group. The current members get a heavy hitter that could act in a way similar to China in terms of funding infrastructure and encouraging economic growth. As for India, it benefits from building stronger regional ties with the kind of less powerful nations that China is currently currying favor with over the last few years. That extra backing could prove vital because China is also becoming a major problem for India and its involvement in BRICS. Beyond the active military skirmishes India faces along the LAC, China's cleverly leveraged its BRI program to potentially cut India out of being involved in the very economic expansion that it joined BRICS to support. China is building stronger regional ties with the BRI. It's also using the program to put itself in a position where it can place smaller regional powers into debt, reinforcing its own militaristic ambitions, while all India can do is sit back and watch. With several of the BRICS members highlighting their anti-Western agenda, India is in a position where its voice is growing quieter and its continued membership could spell trouble for its desire to stay neutral. But BRICS isn't all bad for India. There's no denying India's enjoyed major GDP growth since joining BRICS. Its economic ambitions have been realized and there's a strong case to be made that the country will only get stronger in that department with each passing year. Reuters predicts a 6.3% growth for 2023 and 2024, keeping India on the generally upward trend it's enjoyed for over a decade. Additionally, BRICS expansion doesn't necessarily spell doom for India going forward. It actually raises the possibility of it forming deeper ties with its new countries added to the group. Though those ties come with the issue of potentially alienating India from its Western allies. Still, if India stays as adept at walking the line between East and West as it has been since the formation of BRICS, there's a chance it could reap further economic benefits while continuing to enjoy support from the West should China become more aggressive. Leaving BRICS would also mean that India's voice disappears entirely, rather than simply being diminished or diluted. Does India want to risk losing any chance it has of steering BRICS in its desired direction by completely leaving the group, leaving China and Russia as the two major players controlling the conversation? All three would be compelling reasons to stay, were it not for the fact that India's influence on BRICS is already waning and it faces direct aggression from China. And given that Russia seems to be in China's corner, especially in terms of how to use BRICS to break the Western hold on geopolitics, India may find itself with two powerful enemies in the group should it decide to stay. All of that leads us to a simple conclusion, India has to leave BRICS. It must do so to shore up its ties to Western powers in case Chinese aggression on the LAC grows. It also must leave to prevent the organization from holding it back as the global superpower it has the potential to become. Do you agree with that conclusion or do you think there are benefits to ongoing BRICS membership that justify India remaining a part of the group? 
Share your views in the comment section below. Given the sheer number of huge, world-changing events that have occurred across the last 20 or so years, from the Iraq War to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's safe to say we're living in turbulent times. Over the course of two decades, there's also been a notable shift in the landscape of global economics and geopolitics. We've witnessed firsthand the rise of the BRICS nations and how they've positioned themselves as an interesting point of contrast to the G7. And if you have no idea what any of that means, don't worry, we're here to explain it all to you. This is BRICS versus G7, exploring the differences between these two international economic powers and how BRICS ended up surprising everyone by overtaking the formerly dominant G7. First, let's cover the basics. First coined by Goldman Sachs economist Jim O'Neill, BRICS refers to the following collection of nations – Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. BRICS is not just some nonsensical political term, it's an acronym of all the members. When O'Neill came up with the term in 2001, he lumped together these countries given that they all shared one thing in common – each of their economies was experiencing rapid growth. He even predicted that, by 2050, these BRICS nations would collectively account for the majority of the global economy. BRICS has been developing relatively successfully for so long that since 2022, the economic group has been seeking to expand its membership with several other developing countries interested in joining their ranks. Other growing economies like Bangladesh, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates were all invited to join BRICS in 2023, and a whole laundry list of other countries contending for membership include Algeria, Kazakhstan, and Thailand. So, what does this all mean? Are all these countries teaming up to share their wealth and resources through lucrative trade deals and cooperation? Well, not exactly. The reason that BRICS was first identified as an economic group was for the sole purpose of highlighting investment opportunities. After all, if a country's economy is experiencing growth, it seems like a good idea to invest in companies that are contributing to that growth. BRICS didn't exist as any kind of formal intergovernmental organization until 2006. But now they've formed a recognized geopolitical bloc. Every year since 2009, the governments of each BRICS country meet at formal summits in order to coordinate multilateral economic policies, meaning that they're usually agreed upon and participated in by three or more governments from different countries. BRICS member governments operate on the basis of non-interference with the actual running of each other's countries, and it's more about what each nation can do that will be mutually beneficial for their fellow BRICS members. Given that they only have become an economic organization within the last couple decades, BRICS are essentially the new kids on the block when it comes to the global economic stage. They're considered the foremost geopolitical rival to another heavy-hitting group of countries that might have existed for longer but have more recently been struggling to keep up with the growing success of the BRICS nations. Meet the Group of Seven, otherwise known as the G7. Fifty years ago, a group of government finance ministers from the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and the United States held an informal meeting in the ground floor library of the White House. The purpose of this meeting was to have a discussion about the international economic situation at the time, but it would end up being much more significant, leading to the creation of the G7. The initial group of G7 countries eventually expanded to also include Japan, Italy, and Canada. After its expansion to include all seven member countries, the G7 represented the biggest non-communist economic alliance in the world during the Cold War. These various industrialized countries were booming in productivity thanks to the benefits they all experienced following the outcome of the Second World War. The G7 member countries were all economic powerhouses, with their combined output contributing around 40% of the global gross domestic product. That's the value of all goods produced and all the services provided by a country during a single year. For a long time, the G7 held massive sway over the way the global economy was governed, influencing decision-making thanks to its members all sharing close political, economic, diplomatic, and military alliances. Much like the function that BRICS serves for its members, the G7 provides a way for its member countries to hold formal discussions and to coordinate potential solutions to a lot of major global issues, especially when it comes to issues surrounding trade, national and international economics, and climate change. Every year, the annual G7 summit sees each member country's head of government or state meet with each other, as well as the European Union's Commission President and the European Council President. However, there are often smaller meetings between other high-ranking G7 officials and the EU that take place throughout the course of the year. Representatives from other countries that might not be G7 members are often among those who are invited as guests, as are representatives of international organizations. Russia was also a member of the organization from 1997 until it was eventually expelled in 2014 over their annexing of Crimea. 
hence their involvement in BRICS. The G7 is managed by a president who is rotated out of the role on a yearly basis within each of the member countries. When it comes time for all to meet, the G7 country hosting and presiding over the summit will set the priorities that are to be discussed. For example, as of 2023, the most recent country presiding over the G7 summit was Japan. Although not strictly speaking a legal institution with the ability to directly alter a member country's laws, much like the case of BRICS, the G7 still wields some significant international influence over the politics of its member governments. This isn't always for the worse, however, as the group has been the catalyst for several major initiatives with intended global benefit. For example, combating the HIV-AIDS pandemic, offering developing countries financial aid, and addressing climate change. However, in more recent years, the G7 has received its fair share of criticism too. Many claim that the organization is outdated, and given that it has a far more limited membership, it reduces the amount of global representation present within the group and at their summits. Then, with the rise of BRICS and its own member nations experiencing rapid economic growth and development, the influence and overall effectiveness of the G7 has fallen into question. Are they so stuck in the past that they're stifling their own country's growth and limiting their influence while that of the BRICS countries begins to increase? Since the more recent emergence of their group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have all been exercising their own global economic ambitions. The 15th annual BRICS Summit, their own version of the G7's yearly meeting, took place in the city of Johannesburg, South Africa. Of course, one of their major talking points was expansion, bringing in other countries that had historically been denied much representation within the G7. Almost as if to add extra appeal to those considering joining BRICS, the current economic progress of its members looks highly promising following an event that caused a shakeup across the entire world, the pandemic. If you cast your mind back to 2020, you'll no doubt remember what day-to-day -day life was like during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. On a smaller scale, maybe a lot of local businesses within your hometown or city had to shut their doors to avoid the risk of spreading infections of the coronavirus. Now, remember what was happening the world over with whole countries going into lockdown when cases of the virus occurred. While this served the goal of keeping people safe, especially those most vulnerable to COVID-19, the pandemic had a lasting impact on the global economy. Of course, this was always going to be inevitable, and the survival and safety of people should have been considered more than the ways the coronavirus would affect countries' bottom lines. Keeping the pandemic in mind, the countries that are members of BRICS and were during the time, not including those that have joined since, had the potential to recover quicker from the pandemic-induced recession. In fact, they were able to recover so quickly, there's a fair chance that BRICS nations could ultimately set the economy of the entire globe on an upward trajectory. The economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are all highly complementary to one another. For example, Brazil and Russia have a wealth of natural resources, as do South Africa and India to some extent. China has long had a massive prowess for production, making products that are shipped across the whole world. Think about it, how many things in your own home are made in China? This brings China a huge amount of capital, and being a member of BRICS allows that capital to be invested in the infrastructure of its fellow members to help with the moving of natural resources. This could improve fellow BRICS members' industrialization, helping push them into further stages of development. In fact, given that its members are developing countries, BRICS has had the potential to also expand the size and scope of their individual economies through cooperation within the organization. Their combined gross domestic product is already estimated to be a whopping 45 trillion US dollars, at least according to what is known as purchasing power parity terms, or PPP. This is essentially the rate of conversion between different currencies done as a way to compare the purchasing power of those different currencies. By comparison, in 2021, the G7's GDP was around $44 trillion in PPP. Given that they're already overtaken by around a trillion, mind you, it's not hard to see why people expect BRICS to further surpass the G7's GDP. According to predictions made by the World Bank and other financial organizations, the average annual growth rate for a BRICS member country is around 5%. In contrast, the G7's is less than 4%. As confusing as this can be for those of you who aren't well-versed in global economics, it essentially means that BRICS has a solid foundation that will allow them to sustain more long-term economic growth and stability. We'll break it down even further for you and take a look at each one of the BRICS countries to show you why they've been experiencing such meteoric growth. First, the one that puts the B in BRICS, Brazil. Did you know that Brazil has the largest economy in Latin America? With an estimated GDP of over $2 trillion, 
It's set to be the 10th largest economy worldwide as of 2023. Projections have indicated that Brazil's GDP is also going to increase, projected to go up to the 8th largest in the world by 2028. Being home to well over 60% of the world's largest tropical forest, the Amazon rainforest, Brazil has a large amount of agricultural industry, which is only growing in order to meet rising global demand, with strong prices and technological advancements serving to further drive the growth of agricultural production over the course of the last 20 years. Additionally, Brazil is a country revered for the production of coffee, as well as being a leading exporter of other goods such as soybeans, corn, sugar, meat, and ethanol. Although things aren't all smooth sailing, the country has seen its fair share of struggles in recent years, including employment and income inequality, corruption, and rising inflation. All of these have served to almost wall in the potential growth of Brazil's economy, despite what seem to be favorable odds. On average, its GDP has only grown 0.6% in the previous decade. Next, we come to Russia. And what an interesting case this one is. As we mentioned earlier, the largest country in the world was a former member of the G7 until 2014. However, under the rule of President Vladimir Putin, the country's made a worrying tilt toward authoritarianism, with many of their actions provoking strong reactions from the rest of the world. One such example came in March 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. This was what led to their suspension from the G7, which after recent events, we think is probably indefinite. Obviously, being suspended meant that tensions flared between Russia and the G7, which only worsened after a number of the country's other high-profile dubious actions. Russia offered support for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad after a series of chemical weapons attacks that were connected to Syrian forces. Then there came the widespread suspicion over Russia's involvement and alleged interference in the 2016 United States' presidential election. Of course, arguably Russia's largest-scale unpopular decision in more recent years has been the invasion of Ukraine in early 2022. Economic sanctions have already been placed on Russia when their interference in Ukraine seemed to be increasing, with both the US and European Union making an effort to dissuade any further escalation. Sadly, the sanctions haven't deterred Russia, and now the conflict in Ukraine seems to have no end. In response to the 2022 invasion, the G7 placed further economic sanctions on Russia in an unprecedented condemnation of their actions in Ukraine. Imports of Russian oil and gas were reduced in a number of G7 countries, reducing a large source of revenue for the country. Furthermore, Russian banks were prohibited from conducting transactions using dollars or euros. Further restrictive measures were implemented to target Russia's industrial sector, given how much of that portion of Russia's economy provides resources for its military. Several G7 member countries also pledged over $100 billion to Ukraine in the form of financial aid, with every member except Japan also providing Ukraine with weapons to support their resistance to the Russian invasion. However, the enormous size of Russia and its economic power should not be understated. The sheer landmass of the country alone makes up 11% of the entire planet. As of 2022, they held the position of the world's eighth largest economy, securing a GDP of $2.2 trillion. The unbudging prices of their exports of crude oil have proven to be one of the largest pillars propping up the Russian economy. They are the third biggest petroleum producer worldwide, according to research by the U.S. Energy Information Administration, right behind Saudi Arabia and the U.S. itself. In order to not stay too dependent on these oil and gas exports, though, especially given the number of countries now reducing the amount they buy from Russia in response to the war, the country has been looking to diversify its economy. As of 2021, Russian officials stated they have the ambitious target of increasing the amount of non-energy-related exports by a minimum of 70% by the year 2030. However, they aren't on track to see much growth following recent events. The resultant damage of the ongoing war in Ukraine is likely to shrink Russia's economy by over $150 billion. This could even see the country dropping out of the top 10 global economies by the time we reach the end of 2023. Moving on to a much lighter and more optimistic country in terms of its economic prosperity, India has some of the world's strongest financial discipline, high rates of money saving, and even a great deal of political stability. Despite so many economic uncertainties going on across the world, India's government has stayed firm in its commitment to increase the country's capital spending. This has seen them spend a lot on infrastructure, boosting their economic growth. India even managed to surpass the UK as the world's fifth largest economy in 2022. Roughly 20% of their GDP is fueled by international exports, which sits right at around $3.75 trillion, and according to some estimates is expected to rise as high as $5 trillion by 2028. 
With this prediction, India is set to climb a further two spots, making it the third largest economy globally. Recent reporting has even predicted that the Indian GDP will reach a colossal $26 trillion by 2047, which would make it one hell of a year, as they'd also be celebrating the country's 100th year of independence. The penultimate country in the BRICS group is China, whose projected GDP of over $19 trillion by the end of 23 would account for over 18% of the entire world's GDP. These numbers are only expected to get higher too, and by 2028, China could be making up to more than a fifth of the world's GDP with more than $27 trillion. Following the devastating effects of the COVID-19 outbreak, China's reopening took much longer than most other countries in the world. This had no small impact on their economy, with their growth dropping to only 3%, with lower numbers of property sales and less investment in real estate dragging down their entire economic activity over the course of 2022. However, China's economy is expected to have a rebound up to over 5% thanks to a gradual uptick as trade with its numerous international partners resumed. This momentum pushing them toward potential growth is a marked improvement for China's economy. But even though China's real estate market seems to be stabilizing in early 2023, its economy is still in a vulnerable spot. Then capping off BRICS is the newest member nation, South Africa, which only joined the group in 2010 after a formal invitation from China. Having subsequently been accepted by the other BRIC countries, South Africa has been making the transition away from its former apartheid system and is steadily becoming a majority rule democracy. Since this change began in 1994, the country has been seeing an economic boost. However, the most recent decade has been fraught with challenges that have led to this growth slowing down. Due to inefficiencies in sectors that have become run by the state, South Africa has experienced shortages with their electricity supply. The government's also implemented scheduled power outages, which began all the way back in 2007, and have only gotten longer, lasting up to nine hours a day in 2022. The shortage of power has had a negative impact across all sectors of the South African economy. After all, if the power has to be shut off, business can't run as usual. Add that to the fact that it's also technically a dual economy, and this adds further weight that's slowing down its economic growth. Cyril Ramaphosa, South Africa's president, delivered a State of the Nation address in February 2023, wherein he highlighted prioritizing restoring South Africa's energy security as well as the continued growth of their economy, creating jobs and thus building better lives for the citizens. South Africa's GDP was estimated to be almost $400 billion in 2023, with expectations that it'll climb to well over this figure if things start to turn around. As you can see, although it's something of a mixed bag, and while that was only an overview on the whole, things are looking up for BRICS. The same can't be said for the G7, though. It was thought that after having suspended Russia from participating in 2014, the economic group would be in a better position to carry out collective action. The thought was that without Russia, the remaining member countries would be more like-minded, sharing common interests and values. However, none of them could have foreseen that only two years later President Donald Trump would disrupt the supposed harmony of the G7 countries. Trump opposed the G7 on a number of their common interests, particularly with regard to trade and climate change. In 2017, taking part in his first G7 summit, Trump refused to commit the US to the Paris Agreement, which is a treaty created to combat climate change. When Trump alluded to his plans to withdraw from the agreement, other members of the G7 had no choice but to single the US out. Trump then used this as fuel to stoke the fire of his extremist supporters, claiming that America's allies were taking advantage of the US. Given his supporters' erroneous and staunch denial of the evidence of climate change, we guess he was just playing to his audience. Additionally, his ties with Russian President Vladimir Putin caused Trump to push for Russia to be readmitted to the G7. Following the summit, the German Chancellor at the time, Angela Merkel, highlighted the turbulence of the group's relationship with the US across the Atlantic. She said that, for the first time since World War II, Europe had to take their fate into their own hands. Many G7 leaders were also concerned, given Trump's bad-tempered relationship with the rest of the group over the duration of his presidency. At the same time, the G7 leaders had a whole laundry list of other challenges to contend with, including trying to navigate the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, leading to a worrying rise in nationalism that's now become part of the Conservative Party's re-election strategy, despite the damage exiting the EU has done to the UK's economy. Additional problems for the G7 arose in the wake of the aforementioned pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
Seeing such a sharp shrinking of the global economy as a result of the pandemic, the governments of the G7 member countries tried to counter with stimulus measures, injecting massive amounts of money into their economies in order to try to prevent the inevitable shrinking. In many countries, the decision has led to record levels of inflation and food shortages. If G7 doesn't get their act together over the next decade, we might see a global economic power shift the likes of which previous generations never could have imagined. Now check out why China is terrified of the US Navy, or check out this video instead.